In this video, I'm going to do a run through of everything in A Level Maths. Now, this video is not a replacement for all of those uh, hundreds of videos that I've done that go through A Level Maths and teach you the content. This video is not designed to teach you the content. It's based on the idea that you have completed all of the content for A Level Maths and you are now revising for the exams. So I'm going to be taking it from that point of view. I'm going to be running through what's in the formula booklet, what's not in the formula booklet, and general tips and advice about things that you can do on the calculator, and also kind of general tips and advice for each topic as we go through. I'm going to be doing it in specification order um, rather than teaching order, um, just so that I can make sure that I've tried to include everything. So with proof, uh, it's split up into proof by deduction, proof by exhaustion, disproof by counterexample, and proof by contradiction. So with proof by deduction, these will be either algebraic proofs or worded proofs. Um, and as part of that, you should be able to recognize what we mean when we write A, and then we use this arrow to B, so A implies B. So if A is true, that means that B is true, but not necessarily in the other direction. And you might have A if and only if B. So this means it works in both directions. So you've got logical consequence and logical equivalence. So you may be tested on the understanding of those arrows. Proof by exhaustion. Essentially, you're just going to try all of the values uh, that you can. So just try everything. Um, a good use of your calculator for that would be the table function. So if you want to substitute in multiple values, um, then use the table function on your calculator to do that. Disproof by counterexample, you just want to find one example where it fails. OK, just one example. Check, uh, does it work for zero? Does it check? Does it work for one? OK, so uh, try uh, the obvious ones first and see if you can find it that way. Proof by contradiction. This is a full A-level maths topic. So these would all appear in AS, but not proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction. Um, there are two that are specifically mentioned in the specification that you need to know, that root 2 is irrational and the proof that there are infinitely many primes. You might be asked to replicate that in the exam, or you might be given the proof and you need to find a stage where it fails, or may, it may be uh, written incorrectly, you need to correct it. The root 2 is a rational one can be adapted to root 3 is a rational, root 5 is a rational, or cube root of 2 is a rational. And it doesn't mean that these are the only types of proof by contradiction you might meet. Uh, you may have to apply it to an unfamiliar uh, proof as well. So um, how to keep an eye out for if proof by contradiction should be used. Quite often, uh, the problem will involve irrational numbers. OK, but have a look at the videos that I've done on proof by contradiction to see some more examples. So in section B, algebra and functions, the first thing is indices. So you should know all of your index laws. Uh, x to the a times x to the b is, of course, x to the a plus b. x to the a of x to the b is x to the a minus b. x to the a in brackets to the power of b is equal to x to the ab. And that's particularly useful, this one, because you can also obviously manipulate that because a times b is the same as b times a. So this is the same as x to the b to the a. So don't forget that you can switch those round. That is quite useful for some index problems. Um, the eighth root of x is x to the power of 1 over a. 1 over x to the a is x to the minus a. And of course, x to the 0 is equal to 1. Then we have thirds. Now, I understand that, of course, you'd be able to plug these first three into your calculator, and it would be able to uh, give you an answer in its simplest form. That's fine. I understand that. But you do need to be able to show any of the working to get there. So you should be able to simplify root 32, for example. So spotting that 32 is 16 times 2. So 16 times 2, and of course root 16 is 4, and then it's root 2. So 4 root 2. 
You should be able to rationalize the denominator for 1 over root 3. So knowing that you need to multiply that top and bottom by root 3 and then simplifying. Then 2 plus root 2 over 3 take away root 3. You should be able to rationalize the denominator here. So we multiply by the conjugate of the denominator there. So just change that middle sign and you should all work out. And the way that you're going to be caught out if you are unable to do this and you're relying solely on your calculator is if algebra is thrown in. So you need to be able to do this also and to write that out in a, as neat a way as possible. So quadratics. First and foremost, I expect you to be able to sketch any quadratic of the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So use your uh, calculator, either a scientific calculator or your graphical calculator to do that. Your scientific calculator will be able to find you the roots. Uh, it should also be able to find you the minimum maximum point of the quadratic as well, if you're using the Casio class with. So you can use all of that to your advantage. If needs must, you could always go to differentiation to find a stationary point also. Okay, so find the minimum maximum point using differentiation. You can do that. Now, as for the discriminant, the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac as part of the formula, the quadratic formula, which isn't given to you in the formula booklet. So the quadratic formula, x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now the b squared minus 4ac part within the square root, if that is positive, then you have two distinct real roots. If it is equal to zero, then you've got repeated roots. And if it's less than zero, you've got no real roots. Okay, And that then leads to algebraic problems later on down the line and links in with inequalities. You should be able to complete the square of a quadratic. Um, you should be able to do it algebraically. Okay, uh, But don't forget that the Casio class whiz can help you do that. But if there's algebra involved, then you might need to do it by hand. So make sure that you can. Factorizing also, you can use your calculator to help. I use it quite a lot to, to uh, factorize quadratics, especially if the number in front of the x squared isn't 1. So make sure you use that. Use your calculator to find the roots and then work backwards. And then you've got hidden quadratics. So equations like this that have quadratic features. It's focusing and recognizing that e to the 2x here is the same as e to the x all squared. So you've got something squared plus something, take away 2 is equal to 0. And then recognizing, OK, well, maybe I can factorize that, where I would have e to the x and e to the x. So I need to get minus 2. So plus 2 and minus 1 in order to get the 1 lot of e to the x. And now it is factorized, and that allows me to solve the equation. Now, with simultaneous equations, don't forget what your calculator can do for you. If it's in this form, it, by hand you would use most likely the elimination method, and you should be able to do that from GCSE. But you should just be able to pop that straight into your calculator and solve it. OK, and that'd be fine. If it's in this form, where you've got two linear graphs, then you could always rearrange and manipulate it into that form to then plug it into your calculator. Okay, But you could also just put one equal to the other and solve that way. I would ex probably expect that to be quicker. When you've got um, something like this, where you've got a linear graph and a quadratic curve, then you're going to have to use algebra to do it. Put one equal to the other, substitution, and then solve. Um, that would be the best way. Your calculator, the Casio class whiz, certainly cannot deal with that. Now with inequalities, I would expect you to be able to solve a basic linear inequality like this by just rearranging, subtracting 5 from both sides, dividing through by 3. Easy. Then you get to something like this. You must remember that if you divide or multiply through by a negative, then that changes the direction of the inequality symbol. So. If you divide through by minus 8, you're going to get x is greater than minus 2. 
Okay, so 16 divided by minus 8 is minus 2, but because I've divided through by a negative, it changes the direction of the inequality symbol. Solving a quadratic inequality like this, I would expect you to be able to solve the quadratic, so find its roots, either by factorising or using your calculator. So you should be able to spot that that's x plus 3, x minus 1, and then utilise a sketch to determine the region. So sketch the quadratic minus 3, 1, where is the parabola above the x-axis? It's there and there. So when x is less than minus 3 and when x is greater than 1. Okay, now I would expect you to write your answer in either interval notation or set notation. Okay, sometimes the question will state which to use and sometimes it won't. Okay, now with interval notation, if I was to write the answer to that in interval notation, then I would be writing that x belongs to, and um, we're going from minus infinity up to minus 3. And I'm using curved brackets because we're not including those. Or, so using the union there, 1 up to infinity. OK, so we've got those two distinct regions. With set notation, remember to use curly brackets. And I would state x is such that x belongs to the real numbers. And x is less than minus 3. And because we've got two regions, I'm going to do it as two sets. Union, curly bracket, x is such that x belongs to the real numbers, x is greater than 1. Now, there are, of course, alternatives to how people write out their set notation, but as long as it is unambiguous, you should be fine. Sketching inequalities. So this is essentially sketching. Can you sketch a straight line? but recognise what region that you are considering. So here, y is greater than 2x plus 3. So a simple sketch. Here's your line. Now, because it's greater than, we want that to be a dashed line. And then check a point, OK? So I label it, OK? So that's with the 3, and that would be minus 3 halves. So choose a point that's not on the line, so 0, 0, for example. So if x is 0, y is 0, is 0 greater than 3? No. So it's actually this upper region that I want. Okay. So it might say sh shade uh, the region or label the region R. Um, so you should be able to deal with that for linear and quadratic inequalities. If it's greater than or less than, then you've got the dashed line or the dashed curve. And if it's less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, then it should be a solid line or a solid curve. So with polynomials, of course, I expect you to be able to collect like terms, expand out brackets, factorise as necessary. With polynomial division, some will use the grid method, some will use long division. Uh, as long as you have a method that you are happy with that always works for you. Now, the factor theorem, remember to make use of that. So remember that states that x minus a is a factor of p of x if and only if p of a is 0. So here, p of x is a polynomial. OK, so that is your factor theorem. Make use of that and don't forget to include a concluding statement. OK, um, so if you've shown p of a is 0, then state, therefore, x minus a is a factor of p of x. Simplifying rational expressions. So this is often something that you get as a result of the quotient rule, for example. Um, so you need to be able to simplify this down. So here, of course, we're assuming that x can't be minus 2. So if you if you have that x can't be minus 2, then what you can then do is then divide through by x plus 2. All terms get divided through by x plus 2. So we're going to have two lots of x plus 2. I should write. Take away two lots of 2x plus 1. Uh, over x plus 2 cubed.
okay? And then you can simplify out the numerator by expanding the brackets. So let's talk about sketching and all the different types of graph that I would expect you to be able to sketch. Now, some of these I expect you'll find easier to do than others. So first of all, any linear graph, you should be able to sketch that in any form that it's given. The same with a quadratic, uh, I've already kind of mentioned that, so utilize your calculator to get roots. Um, if it's in factorized form, like it is here, then brilliant, use that to your advantage. I also expect you to be able to sketch cubics, so in factorized form like this. Um, so you might have repeated roots, you might not. Uh, make sure you're well versed and practice with that. You should be able to sketch the modulus of a linear function. Um, now, other boards, so I teach AQA, we just look at the modulus of a linear function. Um, other boards, however, check your specification. You might then also have to do the modulus of other functions as well. Um, any kind of rational function like this, y equals 2 over x uh, or y equals 3 over x squared, I'd expect you to be able to sketch those. Um, I'd also expect you to be able to sketch uh, horizontal and vertical translations of those as well. So this is also, you know, taking all this into account, um, thinking about graph transformations as well. Uh, log curves log base 2 of x, for example, or the natural log of x take away 1. Uh, exponential graphs, y equals 2 to the x plus 1, y equals 8 plus e to the minus x. And of course, with these come the asymptotes as well, as they do here. So making sure that you're drawing those in, you should have vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Um, so vertical and horizontal for those. Uh, vertical for these, horizontal for these. Then you've got your trig graphs, so sine x, cosine x, tan x, arc sine, arc cosine, arc tan, cosec, sec, and cot. You should be able to sketch all of those and uh, transformations of them. Obviously, if you've got a graphical calculator, then it helps a great deal with sketching. Um, but whether you've got a graphical or not, you should know how to sketch these. So all of this is full A-level and not AS material. First of all, I expect you to be able to identify types of graph and know about one-to-one, -one, many to one, one to many, and many to many. So one-to-one -one would be something like y equals x, for example. Uh, many to one, y equals sine x or y equals x squared. Uh, one to many, x equals y squared. So uh, you know, we don't come across many no pun intended, one-to-many graphs. And then uh, we've got many-to-many, -many, which is something like a circle or an ellipse. Um, so you need to know that of those, uh, the functions are one-to-one -one and many-to-one, because a function means you've got one uh, input leads you to one output. OK, so for each of your inputs, you only have one output. That's the key bit here. So the fact that they've only got one output, that tells you which ones are functions. Now, even and odd functions, they're not specifically mentioned in the specification, but I think they're so useful to know. Um, so with even functions, it's knowing that f of minus x is equal to f of x. OK, so uh, a curve like cosine x is an even function because it has the y-axis as a um, symmetry line, a line of symmetry. And odd functions are those where you've got f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. So y equals sine x, for example, is an odd function. Uh, y equals x cubed is an odd function. So these have rotational symmetry of order 2 about the origin. I expect you to be able to identify the domain and range, know which one is which. So the domain is talking about the x values that can be inputted, and the range are the y values that can be outputted. Uh, the domain and range uh, may well be written uh, in interval notation or in set notation. Know that when you're talking about the domain, you're talking about x. Okay, So you should only have x within your set notation. 
whereas the range should be talking in terms of y or the named function, so f of x, for example. Um, with composite functions, you should be able to substitute one function into another and recognize the order. So if you've got f g of x, for example, then that is you substituting g of x into f. So you read it from right to left. g is going into f. So if I had g f of x, this is f of x being substituted into g. OK? And of course, you can have f f of x, g g of x, etc. With inverse functions, you should be able to um, find the inverse function of a given function by going through the algebraic process. So if you've got, uh, let's say, f of x is equal to, let's go with something basic, 2x plus 3, then you start off by putting y is equal to 2x plus 3, swapping the x's and y's, then rearranging to get y equals, and then you replace the y with f minus 1 of x equals. Now, when you do that, you should also identify um, the domain of your inverse function. Okay, So make sure that you include the domain of your inverse function once you've defined your inverse function. Now, if you're a little bit unsure about what the domain of your inverse function is, check the original function, because you remember the domain of the inverse is the range of the original function. And the range of the inverse is the domain of the original function, and vice versa. Okay, So don't forget those uh, connections. Now, you might be asked to sketch the inverse function, given the original function. Remember, they are reflections of one another in the line y equals x. That's why when you go through the process of finding the inverse function, you swap the x's and y's. That reflects your graph in the line y equals x. And that should make sketching the inverse function a little bit easier for you, if you know that fact. So now on to graph transformations. You should be able to describe a translation by a vector, so translation by vector 2, 3, for example, reflections in the x-axis and y-axis, and also the line y equals x, and that links in quite neatly with looking at inverse functions. Stretches should be parallel to the x-axis or parallel to the y-axis by some given factor. So you should be able to describe them and apply them as necessary. Combinations, so you should be able to identify uh, what transformations have occurred here and whether the order matters. Now remember, if both of the transformations are inside or both are outside, then the order matters. So these two examples, the order will matter. This example, the order does not matter. So you should identify that as a stretch parallel to the x-axis factor one-third and a translation by the vector zero, two. For this one, okay, because they are both inside, you should deal with the translation first and then the stretch. Okay? So what you want to think about is doing bid mass backwards when it's inside. So that means we deal with the addition first, then the multiplication. So a translation by the vector minus 2, 0, followed by a stretch parallel to the x-axis factor 1 third. For this one, okay, when they're both outside, do bid mass in the correct order. So deal with the multiplication first, then do the translation. So this will be a stretch parallel to the y-axis, factor 3, followed by a translation by the vector 0, 2. Now with partial fractions, these are the three forms that you need to be able to deal with. So, quite often this is used for integration purposes, but you might just be asked to do this um, just as a standalone question. So you should recognise that that could be written as a over x plus 1 plus b over x plus 2. Then multiply through by the denominator, and then you've got a choice of using substitution, which is the way that I do it, substituting numbers in to work out the values of a and b, or you can use comparing coefficients. Then with this form, this is a over x plus 1 plus b over x plus 2 plus c over x plus 3. Okay, And then you use a similar method to before. 
With this one, this is the one you've got to watch out for because of that squared term over the x plus 2. So you're going to have a over the x plus 1. Then you're going to have b over x plus 2. But you're also going to need c over x plus 2 squared. And then deal with it from there. So with straight lines, you should be able to recognize any form. So y equals mx plus c is the bog standard one that you should be used to. Um, I always go for y minus y1 equals mx minus x1 when I'm trying to find the equation of a line through two points. And then you might be asked to write it into the form ax plus by plus c equals zero, for example. Okay. You should also be able to recognize when two lines are parallel and when they are perpendicular. So they're parallel when they've got the same gradient. They're perpendicular if the gradients multiply together to make minus one. Okay. So remember, if you've got one line has the gradient m1 and one line has the gradient m2, they should multiply to make minus one. That is how you show that two lines are perpendicular. Now with circles, you should be able to recognize the form x take away a squared plus y take away b squared is equal to r squared. You should be able to read off the center and the radius from a circle equation in that form. So center to a, b with radius r. You should be able to work with a circle equation of this form and using completing the square, get it into that form. Okay, so you should also be able to get into that form and also from that be able to check whether this is actually the equation of a circle or not. Now, circle theorems, are you're not going to go into such detail as you do with GCSE, but uh, the ones that you need to know are that if you've got this as a diameter of your circle, then if I draw a triangle, using that as one of the sides and all three sides, or all three corners rather, touch the outside of the circle, and this will be a right angle, okay? We've also got that if I draw a chord, so there's a chord, and then if I draw a line through the chord, okay, and if this line makes a right angle there, then it bisects the chord, so that length and that length will be the same. And then finally, if I draw on a radius, the circle, like so, then the tangent to the circle at that point so there's your tangent, we'll make a right angle. Now don't forget that uh, this is your tangent line and this line here that goes through would be the normal to the circle. Now you may be asked to find the equation of the normal or the equation of the tangent um, in, within circle problems. Now, parametric equations is not AS material, it's full A level. You should be able to convert from Cartesian form to parametric form and also vice versa for a number of examples. So I've gone through all of those and the different types that you might meet uh, in my playlist. You should be able to work out the intercepts, so where a parametric curve crosses the X and Y axes. So, for example, if you had x is equal to t take away 2, t plus 1, and y equals t, t take away 5, then you should be able to identify that uh, the curve will cross the y-axis when x is 0. So we put x is equal to 0, and so you know that it's crossing when t is 2 and when t is minus 1. And then you can substitute t is 2 and t is minus 1 into the y equation, and that will tell you where it's crossing the y-axis. So always think of t as time. I quite often do it like that. So it links in with when we're dealing with projectiles. So think about your methods for solving parametric equations in the same way as the methods that you use for projectile problems. Now you could be asked to work with parametric differentiation. Okay, so you need to know that dy by dx is equal to dy by dt times by dt by dx. Now some people remember that as dy by dt 
over dx by dt. And quite often, people prefer that. Now, with differentiation, you might be asked to find um, uh, stationary points, but you won't be asked to go into second derivatives. Okay, so anything with second derivatives, we're not going to deal with. Then you've got integration. So integration, normally you're dealing with y dx. Okay, now if you're going to convert that into parametric integration, then you're still going to have the y, but we're going to need to introduce dx by dt, dt. So we introduce a substitution, and that's what you work with for parametric integration between the limits of uh, two values of t. Okay, so when you're dealing with problems like this, you need to be a little bit careful with figuring out which values of t you need to use. But take a look at some uh, at the videos I've got going through examples of using that. Now, with binomial expansion, this is what's given to you in the formula booklet. Now, I've taken this from the AQA formula booklet because that's the exam board that I teach. But you will see something similar to this in your exam board's formula booklet as well. Now, this bit here uh, is likely what you did in your first year of A-level maths. So this is the formula that you would use for something like 2 plus 3x to the power of 4. Now, you want some way of setting this work out. So I don't tend to write it out like that. Um, I tend to write it out in some kind of grid. So three terms, like so. And you're always going to have one more row here than that number there. So we're going to have five rows. So two, three, four, five. OK, now the first column will be Pascal's triangle. Now, for something like four, you might just want to write out Pascal's triangle until you get to the one with four there. So one, four, six, four, one. Alternatively, you can use the NCR button on your calculator. Four choose zero, four choose one, four choose two, four choose three, four choose four. Then your middle row, or middle column rather, will be twos. Your final column will be three x's. Make sure that goes in a bracket. Now the reason why you're gonna put it in a bracket is because if you want it in ascending powers of x, you're going to put 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then that makes sure that you're doing 3 squared, 3 cubed, 3 to the 4. OK? So ascending powers of x would be like that. And then you'd have 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And then you're multiplying everything out. And then you should get to the correct answer. Now, you may be asked to find um, the coefficient of a particular term within a binomial expansion, and I would use this same kind of technique using those three pieces. I've got videos on that in the playlist. You might also come across algebraic equations that utilise the NCR function here, okay, and utilise the factorials. I've done videos on that as well. Okay, that's a very kind of specific type of algebraic problem. Now, this second formula that you have here, uh, you would most often use. You can use it to do something like two plus three x to the four, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, I would probably set it just out like I've done there. This one you're going to utilise if you've got it uh, to the power of minus 4 or a quarter or something like that. So when n is negative or fractional or both. Now, if you had to do 2 plus 3x to, um, let's say, to the power of minus 2, and you wanted to find the first three terms, then you can't just dive in and just use this formula as it stands because it needs to be in the form of 1 plus or 1 minus. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to prepare it. And I'm going to factor the two out of those two terms in the bracket. 1 plus 3 halves x to the minus 2. And then you've got 2 to the minus 2 times 1 plus 3 halves x to the minus 2. And so that's 1 quarter times 1 plus 3 halves x to the minus 2. You can do the binomial expansion on that and then multiply through by the quarter. And then you've got your result. OK? Now, you might be asked for the range of values for which the expansion is valid, the range of validity. That utilises the mod x is less than 1 there. Okay. Um, now, 
what you do is you go with the 1 plus 3 halves x and replace the x in here with 3 halves x. So it's valid for 3 halves x modded is less than 1. Divide both sides by 3 halves and you get mod x is less than 2 thirds. Now, uh, the one thing to really make sure you don't get caught out on is this bit here. Remember that that is saying 1 times 2. So this decimal point is representing a multiplication, not a decimal point. So it's not 1.2. This is 1 times 2. And that's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 all the way up to R. So this is 2 factorial, and that's R factorial. Okay. Now with sequences, you should be well versed in utilising the notation UN. And here UN is equal to 3N take away 5 would be the nth term of a sequence. Then we've also got inductive definition, so sometimes refer to that as a deductive definition. Here is an inductive definition, so this is how we find the next term in the sequence. We uh, divide the previous term by 2 and then take away 3. So this is referring to the next term in the sequence, that's the previous term. Now you might be asked to find the limit of a sequence like that, and you do that by swapping out the un plus 1 with l and the un with l and then solving that equation to get l equals. Now you can check that result by choosing a starting value and then typing it into your calculator and then keep on pressing equals. So bring it in as the using the answer key on your calculator. Keep pressing equals and you should home in on the same limit that you get from solving that equation. You should also be aware of what we mean by an increasing and a decreasing sequence. So an increasing sequence is one where the next term is always greater than the previous term. And a decreasing sequence is where the next term is always less than the previous term. OK. Um, now, you might be asked to prove that. And uh, quite often, the way to go about that is to replace out the n in the um, nth term with n plus 1 and show that that number is always greater than that or that is always less than that. Okay, So that's usually the way that you would go about that type of problem. With a periodic sequence, um, periodic sequence would be something like uh, 2, 0, 3, 2, 0, 3, 2, 0, 3. For example, this is a periodic sequence with period 3. Um, they could bring uh, sine or cosine into this as well as part of the nth term. Um, and that should um, pinpoint for you, OK, well, it's probably going to be a periodic sequence because they put in a periodic function into the nth term. Now, with the inclusion of the sigma notation button on the calculator, so on the Casio class with, for example, you don't often see questions in an A-level maths paper that include the sigma notation as part of a sequences problem. They came up more often in the old specification. So in order to get around that, um, it's likely that you'll see algebra put into the problem. So can you evaluate this, for example, uh, rather than can you evaluate that, where yes, you can, because I can just do that on my calculator straight off. Whereas you should be able to recognise that to the right of the sigma notation, uh, you've got the nth term of the sequence, and this would therefore be an arithmetic sequence. And then you can use the arithmetic summing to n formula, so sum to five terms, in order to work out the sum. Now, if it was of this form, then you might well have to write out all of the terms, OK, and then evaluate it and collect like terms at the end. With arithmetic sequences, you're not given the nth term formula in the formula booklet. So you need to remember that it is un is equal to a plus n minus 1 times d, where a is the first term, n is the number of terms, and d is the common difference. You are given the sum to n terms formula, however. So you're given it in two forms. 1 half n times a plus l, well, where l is the last term, and 1 half n times 2a plus n minus 1d. Now, you'll use this one if you know l, and you'll use this one if you don't know l the last term.
Just as it is with arithmetic sequences, you're not given the nth term for a geometric sequence either in the formula booklet. You need to remember that un is a times r to the n minus 1, where a is the first term and r is the common ratio and n is the number of terms. You are given to the, the sum to n terms formula, so a times 1 take away r to the n over 1 minus r, and you're also given the sum to infinity formula, a over 1 minus r, but remember that only works when r is between minus 1 and 1. Now, I would recommend that you know uh, the derivations of this and the arithmetic sequences sum to n terms as well, okay? Because you might uh, have questions in the exam, or a question in the exam rather, um, that goes through the steps and it might require you to kind of finish the proof off or spot a mistake in the proof or something like that. So I, it's well worth you going back and seeing how they were derived just in case. So everything up to here is on the AS paper but radians is not, that's full A level, okay? So, I expect you to be able to work with Sokotoa, right angle triangles, knowing that sine of the angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse, cosine is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse, and tan is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, okay? And be able to utilize that in uh, uh, various scenarios, when we're dealing with vectors, when we are dealing with problems in mechanics, uh, or just right angle triangles. Sine rule, so based on this general triangle here, sine rule, a over sine a is equal to b over sine b is equal to c over sine c. And you can flip that up the other way. So sine a over a is sine b over b is equal to sine c over c. Uh, you generally use that one if you're looking for a side, and this one if you're using it to find an angle. The cosine rule, a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared, take away 2bc cosine a. Okay, so uh, cosine rule, sine rule, error of a triangle is equal to 1 half a b sine c. Okay, now none of those formulae are given to you in the formula booklet. You need to know them. Now, with radians, uh, you should be able to convert between degrees and radians. If you remember that 180 degrees is the same as pi radians, then that should enable you to convert and get 2 pi, pi over 4, pi over 3, uh, 90 degrees. Uh, 45 degrees, whatever you want, okay, make that conversion. Now, when you're working with sectors, so here is a sector with radius r and angle theta, where theta is given to you in radians, you must use the arc length and sector error formulae in radians. Neither of these are given to you in the formula booklet, so arc length is theta times r, so that one's nice and easy. The sector error is one half theta r squared. You need to know both of those. Now, the small angle approximations are given to you in the formula booklet. Remember, this is with the angle measured in radians. So sine theta is approximately theta. Cosine theta is approximately 1 take away theta squared over 2. And tan theta is equal to theta. Now, sometimes just an algebraic problem might crop up where you need to find out what cosine of 2 theta would be approximately. So um, assuming theta is small and 2 theta is small, of course then you replace the theta here with 2 theta, and you get 2 theta squared over 2, and then you can simplify that down. So 1 take away 2 theta squared. So you could be asked to do a simple algebraic problem like that, or they could be utilized as part of um, differentiation from first principles. So if you're differentiating sine or cosine from first principles, you can use the small angle approximations to do it. These do crop up in a few different scenarios, so um, be aware of them. Um, and also, you know, problems like integration, 
you could potentially utilize them as part of that as well um, if again theta is small okay so there can be some problem solving questions that might not first look like it's small angle approximations but actually turns out to be the case now for the basic trig functions sine x cosine x and tan x as I've already pointed out, I expect you to be able to sketch them, whether it be in degrees or in radians. Remember, radians is only for a full A-level maths and not AS. I expect you to know how to identify the period of these functions. So the period of sine x is 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. Cosine x is 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. Tan x is 180 degrees or pi radians. I also expect you to be able to calculate exact values for these functions. So um, where x could be 0, um, pi over 3, pi over 4, pi over 6, pi, um, or in degrees. And um, the way that I always uh, teach it is using the two right angle triangles. So the first triangle is um, an isosceles right angle triangle so 1 1 root 2 and of course they would have to be pi over 4 and pi over 4 so if you wanted sine of pi over 4 that is the opposite over the hypotenuse so it's 1 over root 2 now if you did that on your calculator I know the calculator can give you sine of pi over 4 straight off it will give you it as root 2 over 2 because it will rationalize the denominator for you What's useful about remembering these triangles is because it doesn't give you the um, rationalized denominator form, if you spot 1 over root 2 within a problem, then that can help lead you to go, oh, right, that is an exact value, and I can utilize uh, the right angle triangles to get there. Okay, It can help you with some problem solving. So the other right angle triangle is 1, 2, root 3. Now, I haven't drawn this accurately, obviously, but that side is shorter than that one. And so this angle is larger than that one. So this angle is the pi over 3, and that's your pi over 6. Okay. Now, another way of remembering it is that the 3 is always opposite. That's one way of doing it. So if you want sine of pi over 3 or cosine pi over 6, you can use that right angle triangle to find the values. So as I've already mentioned, you need to be able to sketch each of these. So we've got the reciprocal trig functions, y equals cosec x, y equals sec x, y equals cot x. And then we've got the inverse trig functions, y equals arc sine x, y equals arc cosine x, and y equals arc tan x. Okay, now if, you're, if you get it confused as to which one is which between cosec and sec, don't forget the third letter rule. So S, C, and also for cot, so for that being 1 over tan. So cosec is 1 over sine, and sec is 1 over cosine. So we're going to quickly run through how to sketch these, okay, from scratch. So y equals cosec x. So the first thing that I would do, if I can't remember what the graph looks like, is I'm going to draw sine. So there's sine. And I know that cosec uh, will have vertical asymptotes when sine is zero. So there, there, and there. So this point, I'm going to do it in radians. So that point is pi, and that point is 2 pi. And of course, that point is pi over 2, and that point is 3 pi over 2. The maximum there occurs at 1, the minimum at minus 1. Okay, so y equals cosec x will look like this. Then I can easily erase the evidence. <laughs> okay, so that will be cosec x. So you can draw the original function first and then have a think about right what cosec is going to be because remember cosec is one over sine and so when sine is one cosec will be one over one okay and then it's going to tend towards your asymptotes 
So let's take a look at sec. So again, sketch the original curve first. So here's cosine. There's your pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. Uh, sorry, pi, rather. And that's 3 pi over 2. And that's 2 pi. Apologies for that. So that's 1. And that's minus 1. Now, sec x um, will be undefined when cosine is 0. So where it crosses the x-axis, so there and there. And so sec x will look like this. And then if I raise the original curve, there we are, okay? So this is the one that kind of looks like a crying face, essentially. So that's y equals sec x. All right, okay. Now let's go for cot x. Right, so first of all, I'm sketching tan, pi, 2 pi, that's pi over 2, that's 3 pi over 2. So cot is undefined when tan is 0, so that's there, and there, and there. And so cot does that. And that. Okay, so if I get rid of the original curve, okay, oh, and that bit. Obviously, you can't erase lines in the exam, but um, unless uh, you do it in pencil, uh, but that will be your cot x. Okay, right. And then we get to everyone's favourites. Uh, y equals arc sine x, y equals arc cosine x, and y equals arc tan x. Now, with these, if you get confused, draw the original curve first, so sine. So, for arc sine, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it like that. So, that's the piece of sine that I am interested in. So, that's pi over 2. That's minus pi over 2. That's 1. And that's minus 1. So for arc sine x, you need to reflect this graph in the line y equals x. Okay? So this point here, the end point, is currently at pi over 2, 1, so it will become 1 pi over 2. So the curve shape will actually look like this when you do that. So this point is at 1 pi over 2. So swap those coordinates around, and then this point um, is at minus pi over 2, minus 1, so it's now at minus 1, minus pi over 2. And that is arc sine of x. Okay? Right, so that's arc sine. Now, for arc cosine, Again, I'm going to do a quick little sketch of cosine. Now, I'm just going to do it from there to there. Okay, remember that this function needs to be made 1 to 1. So that's pi over 2. That's pi. That's 1. That's minus 1. So we now need to reflect this curve in the line y equals x. So you get a curve that looks like this. So... This point here, which is currently at 0, 1, will get reflected to 1, 0, so there. This point at pi over 2, 0, will go to 0, pi over 2. And this point, which is at pi minus 1, will go to minus 1, pi. Okay, and so that is arc cosine of x. And as we're working through this, you should be taking note of making sure you know the domains and ranges of these functions. So the domain here between minus 1 and 1, the range between 0 and pi. Okay? So we've got one last one. So arc tan of x. So a quick sketch 
of 10. So the piece I want is just that piece there. Now that's pi over 2, and that's minus pi over 2. So I'm going to reflect that in the line y equals x. So the vertical asymptotes become horizontal, like so. And so the curve looks something like that. And so that is pi over 2, and that is minus pi over 2. Okay, and so that's how we can quickly sketch the reciprocal and inverse trig functions. So what are the trigonometric identities that you should know? Well, if you are uh, just doing AS maths, then these are the two you need to know. Tan theta is sine theta over cosine theta. Sine squared plus cos squared is 1. Now, full A level, we learn two more that are developed from the sine squared plus cos squared is 1. Now, you either memorize these or you know how to work them out from sine squared plus cos squared is 1, which is the way that I do it. So, if we divide this through by sine squared, sine squared divided by sine squared is 1. Cosine squared divided by sine squared is cot squared. And 1 divided by sine squared is cosec squared. Then we go back to this one. Divide through by cosine squared now. Sine squared divided by cosine squared is tan squared. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared is 1. 1 divided by cosine squared is sec squared. None of these are given to you in the formula booklet. You need to know how to get to them. These are the compound angle formulae. They're given to you in the formula booklet. Uh, you should have seen geometrical derivations of these two here. And you may be asked to um, work through a geometrical derivation uh, within the exam or fill in some blanks or something like that. Um, the tan formula comes with this caveat here. Uh, that's just to make sure that you're not dividing by zero because obviously the uh, identity won't um, work if you're dividing by zero. Now, the double angle formulae can be derived from the compound angle formulae, but you really don't want to have to do that in the exam. Really, you should know the double angle formulae um, off the top of your head and be able to recall them. So, the double angle formulae starts off with sine of 2x. Now, if you were going to derive them, then sine of 2x is sine of x plus x, so you replace the a and the b with x, and you get sine x cosine x plus cosine x sine x, which is 2 sine x cosine x. Cosine 2x can be derived in a similar way, and is cosine squared x take away sine squared x. Replace the sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared, and you get 2 cosine squared x take away 1. Replace the cosine squared with 1 minus sine squared, and you get 1 take away 2 sine squared x. So cosine 2x has three forms. And tan 2x is 2 tan x over 1 minus tan squared x. Now, you may use these um, within uh, proving identity questions um, or solving equations, or uh, you need these uh, when you're integrating sine squared or cosine squared. So if you have to integrate sine squared by itself, then you need to write sine squared in terms of cosine 2x using that identity, and then you can integrate it. So you do use these uh, in multiple parts, okay? So um, they're really, really useful. And you don't, as I said, you don't want to have to derive them in the exam. Now, alongside compound angle formula, it's also used within harmonic forms. So harmonic forms, otherwise referred to as equivalent forms, or uh, just remembered as r sine theta plus alpha, r cosine theta plus alpha. So... Um, you can rewrite 2 sine x plus 3 cosine x in the form of r sine x plus alpha, for example. And then you can use the compound angle formula to break that apart. Um, and then you can rearrange it, and you're trying to find out the value of r and the value of alpha. Okay, I've got plenty of examples going through that in the videos. Don't forget there is a quick way to work out the value of r, and that is by looking at the coefficients of the sine x and cosine x that you have there. 
So it's the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. So r is going to be root 13. So you can get an easy mark there uh, just by looking at the coefficients of the sine x and cosine x. Now I expect when you're solving trigonometric equations by hand that you would have quite a rigorous way of setting your work out and doing it in the same way each and every time. That way leads to success here and you learn uh, a good way of setting your work out. So sine x equals one half between 0 and 360, that would be a bog standard, that's an AS level question. This one is full A level because it's now in radians, okay? But that question could appear in degrees and be on an AS paper. So with this one, you've got to deal with the fact that you've got cosine of 3x rather than cosine x. So you've got to change the period of the function. Then when you get to cot x is 1 8th, um, it's easiest to, rather than think about cot x, uh, use the reciprocal of both sides and then rewrite it as tan x is equal to 8. So 1 over cot x is tan, 1 over 1 8th is 8. And then solve that equation instead between those two bounds. The question could also come up as a hidden quadratic. So don't forget that you can use your quadratic solver on your calculator to help you uh, factorize or find the values of sine x and then to solve the resulting equations. Now, of course, if you've got a graphical calculator that can find you all the solutions, then that is an excellent checking tool, okay? But, you know, it is a checking tool. You should show your working to get to those solutions and know how to get to those solutions. So don't wholly rely on that. Now, when proving trig identities, you need to call upon all of your trigonometric knowledge. So you need to be thinking about the identities that you already know. So you've got tan x is sine x over cosine x. You've got sine squared plus cos squared is 1. You've got 1 plus cot squared is cosec squared. You've got tan squared plus 1 is sec squared. You've got the five double angle formulae as well at your disposal. You need to be keeping an eye out for uh, things like difference of two squares, um, rationalising the denominator, things like that. So some of the proving trig identities can get quite fiddly. Now, when you're doing this, your layout should be that you are going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, or going from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Now, you can work with both sides independently until you get to a match, but you cannot cross that equality, or that equivalence, I should say. Okay? The reason why you can't is because the moment that you do, you have assumed that they are equivalent, and your job is to show that they are. Okay? So you need to get to that. So, uh, with this one, for example, I'd be thinking about, well, the cosec squared, have I got an identity that goes with that? Cosec squared, I know, is 1 plus cot squared. Oh, the 1s are going to cancel, so, so I'm going to have cosine x over cot squared, which should then simplify to that, okay? Have a go at it um, and see if you can get from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Now, you should be able to sketch y equals 2 to the x, y equals 3 to the x. Um, so, let's draw y equals 2 to the x. There we are. y equals 2 to the x. Goes through 1 on the y-axis because that's when x is 0, and it's got the x-axis as a horizontal asymptote. You should also be able to sketch y equals 3 to the x on the same graph. So, it should be below... 2 to the x to the left of, y, of the y-axis, and then above it to the right. Okay, but both go through 1 on the y-axis. Now, y equals e to the x would look just like these, but go between them. Okay, so because you know that e is about 2.71, so that's between your 2 and 3, and so y equals e to the x would go somewhere between those two. Now, the gradient of e to the kx is actually AS material, um, which is a little bit strange, but essentially d by dx of e to the kx is ke to the kx. So, um, 
Second year A-level math students should know that this is the chain rule being applied here. Uh, but at AS um, and in first year, you don't learn it like that. You just know that essentially the coefficient of x comes down to the front. So this is most often seen um, at this level within exponential growth and decay problems. So, for example, you might have an equation like this, which is t capital T, which may be the temperature, um, and it's given as a function of time, where lowercase t is time. So, if you wanted to find the rate at which the temperature was changing with respect to time, then you're finding d capital T by d lowercase t. The a t differentiates to zero, that's gone. And the coefficient of t minus one tenth comes down to the front, multiplies with the five. Five times minus one tenth is minus one half, and so we'd have e to the minus one tenth t. So then, if you wanted to work out uh, the rate at which the temperature was changing when t was equal to three, okay, where three might be three minutes or three hours, then you could substitute three into that, and that would tell you the temperature, so it might be degrees centigrade per minute, or degrees centigrade per hour, okay? So make sure that you're including the units if there's context in the problem. Now you need to know how to convert from exponential form to logarithmic form and back. So if we write y is equal to b to the x, for example, then that is in exponential form. So that can be converted to logarithmic form by saying that x is equal to log base b of y. So this is read as b to the power of x is equal to y. b to the power of x is equal to y. Okay? Now, ln is the special case of log base b when the base is e. So y is equal to e to the x converts to x is equal to natural log of y. Okay? So that means the same thing as that, but now the base is e. So we need to use ln to represent the natural log. Now, sketching the log curve, you should be able to do that. So, you know that y equals e to the x looks like this. Well, log x is the inverse function of e to the x, so they are reflections of one another in y equals x. And so, this is y equals the natural log of x. Okay, so it's got the uh, y-axis as a vertical asymptote, and it goes through one on the x-axis. So you should know how to use and apply the laws of logarithms. So here we've got the base number b is the same, allowing you to write that log base b of x plus log base b of y is log base b of x times y. Log base b of x take away log base b of y is log base b of x over y. Log base b of x to the y is y log base b of x, so you can bring that power down to the front of the logarithm. Log base b of b to the x is equal to x, and that's the same reason as why you can write log base b of b is equal to 1, okay, because x here would just be 1. And log base b of 1 would be equal to 0. Now, the easiest way to see that is if you convert back into exponential form, b to the power of 0 must be equal to 1. So b to the 0 is equal to 1, okay, which we know. Now, when solving exponential logarithmic equations, you should think about, can I convert it into, uh, so an exponential equation into logarithmic form? Will that be the quickest way to get there? And in the case of 2 to the x is equal to 3, that would be, okay? Converting straight to logarithmic form, x is equal to log base 2 of 3, okay? Now, you should also always have uh, a backup plan. And the backup to solving exponential equations is logging both sides. So if you wanted to, for this one, you could take natural log of both sides if you wanted to, or you could take log base 2 of both sides. It's really up to you.
So if I take log base 2 of both sides, I get log base 2 of 2 to the x is equal to log base 2 of 3. We know that that is just going to be equal to x. The x can come down the front. Log base 2 of 2 is 1. And you get your log x is log base 2 of 3. OK, so you can do it that way. That's perfectly fine. And as I said, you could take natural log of both sides if you wanted to. You could take log base 10 of both sides. Um, you can still get to the correct answer. The answer will look different, but that's fine. It'll be equivalent. With something like 3 to the x is equal to 5 to the x minus 1, you're going to have to take logs of both sides. It would probably be best to take logs of base 3 or base 5. But again, you could take base 10, you could take base e. OK, so you might want to have a go at that trying log base 3, for example, make sure you can solve it. With a logarithmic equation like this, log base 2 of x is equal to 3, quickest way is just to convert it into exponential form. So 2 to the power of 3 is equal to x. 2 to the power of 3 is equal to x. So x is equal to 2 cubed, so x would have to be equal to 8. And then, of course, you've got hidden quadratics. You should always be on the lookout for these. Um, the giveaway is because you've got this 7 to the 2x, and you've got 7 to the x there. So 7 to the 2x is the same as 7 to the x squared. So think about 3 times something squared plus 5 times something, take away 2 is 0. Can you factorise that quadratic, or do you need to use your calculator to help you factorise and then solve it? OK, so keep an eye out for hidden quadratics as well. So the crux of reduction to linear form is that you have a graph and some data which fits a straight line, or here's your line of best fit anyway. And your job is to estimate the y-intercept and the gradient of the line and then use those to work out the missing values that are given in the original equation that we are using and that we're working with. Now, in the exam, um, it'll either be one of two different types of problem, really. Um, it'll either be a context-heavy question, where you might have a block of text, and then it'll use one of these, and there'll be a table of values, and you might need to fill in a row of that, taking logarithms, or it might be two rows. And then you plot the data on a graph, you draw a line of best fit with a ruler, and then you estimate the y-intercept and the gradient, and with those you work backwards to then work out the missing values, the a and the n, the k and the b. Okay? Now, the two forms that we start off with is going to be one of these. Now, they may not look identical to those, OK, in the way that they're written. So that first one could be, uh, let's say, capital P is the population. Uh, then we've got A times time to the B, for example. So that, that could be a form for that one. And then this one. Um, could be something like capital T is the temperature and you've got A times 10 to the minus K times T, which is time, say. Now you might be going, well, that doesn't look exactly like that form, Jack. Well, essentially, you've got A, which is the K, times by 10 to the minus K to the T. And that 10 to the minus k is your b that's there. OK? So what do you then do with that? Well, once you've got your starting situation like that, first thing you should be doing is taking logarithms of both sides. Now, what logarithm should you take? Well, that depends on whether it's obvious in the question, right? This one is bound to be log base 10 because of that 10 that you've got there. But another thing that you should be looking out for is the graph. Look at the axes on the graph. OK, so if um, it had something like, um, let's say, t and log 
base 10 of p, for example, then you know that you've got to take log base 10. Okay? You can clearly see it there. If it was ln of p, then I'd be taking natural logarithms. Okay? So, starting with something like that, p equals a t to the b, take logarithms of both sides, so log base 10 I'm going for, and then break that right-hand side apart using your log laws. So this will become log base 10 of a plus log base 10 of t to the b, and then that's log base 10 of a plus b log base 10 of t. Now you'll notice with this example we get log base 10 of t and log base 10 of p. So the graph wouldn't have those axes, it's got that one correct, but actually this horizontal axis would be log base 10 of t. And that's how they are matching up. Okay, so then you would plot your log base 10 of t, your log base 10 of p, plot the data, blah, 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 draw a line of best fit, estimate the y-intercept and the gradient, and then use those backwards because here b would be the gradient and log base 10 of a would be the y-intercept. That allows you to work out what a is. So the alternative is that we work with the other form. So this form here t equals a times 10 to the minus kt. So if I take, let's go with log base 10 again. Log base 10 of capital T is equal to log base 10 of a times 10 to the minus kt, which is equal to log base 10 of a plus log base 10 of 10 to the minus kt, which is going to be log base 10 of a, and that just simplifies to minus kt. So the axes in this case would be t for the horizontal axis and log base 10 of capital T for the vertical axis. Plot your data, draw your line of best fit, estimate the y-intercept and the gradient. The gradient here will be the minus k, so I'm assuming it would actually be going downwards in this case. So uh, it would have a negative gradient. So that's your gradient. And then your y-intercept is the log base 10 of a. OK? And that allows you to work out a. So essentially, you work with the same process, regardless of which one formula you're starting with. You take logarithms, and then you work towards estimating the gradient or y-intercept. If you're just given the graph, gradient, y-intercept, and then you work backwards. So let's say, for argument's sake, that um, the y-intercept turned out to be, uh, uh, let's go with 1.9, and the gradient was equal to 0.3. Then I know that log base 10 of t is equal to uh, 0.3 times t plus 1.9. So t is equal to 10 to the 0.3t plus 1.9. If I want to write that in any other way, that's t is equal to 10 to the 1.9 times by 10 to the 0.3t. So a here is the 10 to the 1.9, and the minus k is equal to minus 0.3. Exponential growth and decay problems are essentially practicing all of these exponential functions and logarithmic functions techniques that I've been going through in this section, uh, but within a contextualized problem. Okay, so uh, it might involve solving an exponential equation, it might involve um, finding the rate of change. It might involve sketching a, an exponential graph or a logarithmic graph. Um, it might be discussing whether the model is appropriate in the context that you are considering. So now that we get on to differentiation, I expect you to know what finding the derivative actually gives you. Okay, so if you've got y is equal to some function of x, then the derivative is giving you a function that tells you the gradient of the tangent to the original curve at any general point. Okay, So that allows you to work out tangents, normals, stationary points, etc. Then 
sketching a gradient function, you're given y equals f of x. So let's say, let's say we draw y equals f of x, and maybe it looks something like that. Then if that's y equals f of x, then your gradient function will cross through the x-axis there and there because that is where uh, the original curve is stationary, so dy by dx will be 0 there. We're going from a negative gradient to a positive gradient to a negative gradient. So we're going below, above, below. So it would look something like this. Okay, and you would probably expect that because here is a cubic, which would be a negative cubic because it's starting on the top left and working its way to the bottom right, and you're getting a negative parabola. So a cubic will differentiate to a parabola. Okay, so you would probably expect something like that. So yeah, I would expect you to be able to sketch a gradient function. The second derivative, d2y by dx squared, or f double prime of x, you need to know what that means. Okay, so that is the rate at which your rate of change is changing. Okay, um, so it's the gradient function of dy by dx. The second derivative allows you to then work with uh, where the curve is concave and convex. So you need to know that a curve is convex when the second derivative is positive and concave when the second derivative is negative. Okay, that then allows you to work out pa uh, points of inflection. So points of inflection uh, occur when the second derivative is equal to zero, but that's a necessary but not sufficient condition because you also need the, um, the second derivative to change sign either side of your point of inflection. Okay, so you need to check, does it go from concave to convex or convex to concave? Okay, so these questions can be quite involved, multiple stages of working, uh, especially with points of inflection problems. Uh, but you need to understand what you are trying to do, what the process is. Okay, now as with differentiation from first principles, the formula is given to you in the formula booklet, that's why I've boxed it off in red. Um, Differentiation from first principles um, can be a, just a generic polynomial, or it could be sine x and it could be cosine x. If it's sine x and cosine x, then you'll be able to use the small angle approximations, or if they're contained within the question, you can be asked to do it via using the two limits. But if that is the case, uh, the two limits will be given to you as part of the question. OK, so if you're a little bit unsure about how that gets used, look back at my videos on differentiation for first principles and then you'll be able to see it and work through. Now, what is AS here? Well, um, AS material would be uh, gradient functions, second derivatives, but no concave convex, no points of inflection, and no differentiation first principles for sine and cosine. But first principles will be for polynomials at AS as well. Now you should know the derivatives of each of these standard functions. Okay, so y equals x to the n, dy by dx is n x to the n minus 1. And y equals e to the kx, we've already seen that one, k e to the kx. So up to that point, that is AS material, okay? Now, going from onwards, this is going to be full A level. So y equals A to the kx. This one people often forget. So y equals 2 to the x, y equals 3 to the x, y equals 3 to the 5x. Now, you can treat this as A to the k all to the power of x and differentiate it that way, if you prefer. Um, alternatively, you can think of this using the chain rule. So the derivative of the kx is just k. The derivative of the a to the x is the natural log of a times by a to the kx. Okay, so if you want to treat this as a to the k, 
to the power of x, then you can just bring that k up to the power and have log of a to the k times a to the kx. Okay, both the same. Y equals sine of kx is going to be k cosine of kx. Cosine of kx minus k sine kx. Tan of kx is k sec squared kx. Now, if you ever forget that tan x differentiates to sec squared in the AQA formula booklet, you're given it. Okay, so this is what's given to you in the formula booklet for AQA. I'll run through that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Y equals natural log of x. dy by dx is 1 over x. Okay, so you should know all of those like that. Okay, you know you should be comfortable with all of those. Now, uh, you should check, if you're not doing AQA, you should check your formula book and see what you've got, okay, um, with respect to a similar table like this. So tan differentiates to sec squared, cosec x differentiates to minus cosec x cot x, sec x differentiates to sec x tan x, and cot x differentiates to minus cosec squared x. You might be asked to prove uh, one of those as part of the exam. And in doing so, you can use the fact that that's 1 over sine, 1 over cosine, 1 over tan. And then you can use the quotient rule, OK? Because the quotient rule is given to you. So the fact the quotient rule is there, it seems uh, apparent that, OK, well, if I'm given that cot x uh, is 1 over tan, I need to differentiate that, I'll use the quotient rule, OK? You could just use that. So. That's what's given to you in the formula booklet. These you need to know. So with optimization problems, if it is one of those traditional style problems and you've got a box, something like this, and maybe um, it's, got, it's just got a square base. I haven't drawn it very well, uh, but you don't know what the height is then it's all about making sure that you can set up a couple of equations, one of which may already be given to you. It really depends on the problem. So we know that the volume, for example, of this box is x squared times h. And we could also work out the surface area, which would be, let's say it's a closed box. We've got a base x squared, so two lots of x squared. We've got uh, x times h and x times h, so we've got four lots of x times h. So we've got a volume equation and a surface area equation. And let's say that we're told that the volume is 200. So if the volume's 200, you can then go 200 is x squared h. So h is 200 over x squared. And then you substitute that into this equation. And then you are then going to go into differentiation okay, to uh, find uh, the minimum surface error, for example. So quite often you have two equations, one of which is going to get rearranged and substituted into the other, regardless of whether it is a bog standard kind of box question like this. Read the question very carefully. It could include some second year differentiation techniques as well. So some of those questions can get quite algebraically intensive, which puts some students off. But if it's in two parts, where well, you've got a part A, show that S, it can be written as this, just in terms of X. That's the bit that I've just shown you there. And then find uh, the minimum point, um, the minimum value of H or minimum value of X um, that would give you that. Or, yeah, the, find the dimensions of the box that would minimize the surface area. Then um, you're just going to go through differentiation and the rigmarole of finding the stationary points. So even if you can't do part A, you should be able to tackle part B and have a good go at that. So I've already mentioned that the quotient rule is given to you in the formula booklet. So there's no reason as to why you should get that wrong. Okay. However, the chain rule and the product rule are not given to you in the formula booklet. Now, the chain rule is concerned with differentiating y is equal to f of g of x. Now, when I differentiate using the chain rule, 
I want to do it as quickly as I possibly can. So the way that I focus on it is I go, right, the derivative of the inside comes outside. So dy by dx would be equal to g prime of x. So the derivative of the inside comes outside. The exterior function differentiates and the interior function stays the same. OK, so that is the chain rule. However, if you want a little bit more structure to it, what you then say is you go, right, I'm going to let u be the interior function. And so I've got y is equal to f of u. You differentiate g. So u du by dx would be g prime of x. And you differentiate y with respect to u, so f prime of u. So dy by dx is dy by du times by du by dx. dy by du is f prime of u. du by dx is g prime of x. So I'll stick the g prime of x at the front. And I've got f prime of u. And what was u? It was g of x. And as you can see, that's exactly what you have there. That is the long-winded way of doing it, and that will always work if you're unsure. But you know, you want to get to the stage where you can spot derivatives quickly. So, uh, for example, if you've got y is equal to, let's say, sine of, um, let's say, x squared plus 1, then dy by dx, the derivative of the inside comes outside, which is the 2x, that's the g prime of x. f prime is the sine, sine I know differentiates to cosine, and the interior function g of x stays the same. Okay, that is what I want to be able to do. Now, connected rates of change problems are going to be using this fact here. Okay, so you're going to have... Um, two rates of change that you can multiply together to get your dy by dx. Now, the types of problems that you deal with there um, essentially could be um, find the rate at which uh, a balloon's radius is increasing with respect to time. So you might need to find dr by dt. And... That's what you want, but then when you're comparing what you have, so let's say you want dr by dt, and the only other variable that you've got working with you is the volume of the, uh, of the spherical balloon or something like that, then you know that you've got dr by dv times by dv by dt. Okay, so um, you might have the, fo the formula for the volume um, of a balloon with respect to its area, which you then need to differentiate and um, flip. OK, find the reciprocal to get dr by dv, because you might be able to get dr, dv by dr. And the dv by dt might be given to you within the question. And then multiply them together, and you've got your dr by dt. So the connected rates of change problems are quite often worded block of text, and you need to find your information from it and set up a derivative. Okay, and that's using the chain rule. The product rule, y is equal to f of x times g of x. So dy by dx is equal to. Now, probably, you know, if you if you're really desperate to remember what the product rule is, it's the quotient rule, cover up the denominator and turn that into a plus. OK, that is the product rule. So f prime of x times g of x plus f of x times g prime of x. I often remember it as the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. OK, that's the product rule. Quotient rule is already given to us. Inverse functions, well... If you need dx by dy, then remember that is 1 over dy by dx. OK? Um, and also, don't forget that the gradient of f of x 
at AB is equal to 1 over the gradient of F prime, so not F prime, F minus 1, the inverse of F at B A. That's quite a useful thing to remember. So now let's consider implicit differentiation and parametric differentiation. We'll start with implicit. Let's say, for example, we've got 2x squared y take away 8x y squared is equal to minus 1. And I want to find dy by dx. So I need to differentiate both sides with respect to x. So this first term, we've got 2x squared times y. So we have to use the product rule. So we have the first 2x squared times by the derivative of the second, which is dy by dx. Then plus the second times the derivative of the first. So y times 4x. So 4xy. Now we get to the second term, we have to differentiate this using the product rule as well. We've got minus 8x times y squared. So we'll have the first times the derivative of the second. So minus 8x times 2y dy by dx. So minus 16xy dy by dx. Plus the second times the derivative of the first. So take away 8 y squared, and then the right-hand side differentiates to zero. Now, the most common errors that people have with implicit differentiation is certainly doing the product rule correctly, and the second issue is forgetting to differentiate the right-hand side to zero in this case. So, quite often, the left-hand side is done perfectly, the right-hand side is left as minus one, and that throws the whole thing. So now from here, if I wanted to find dy by dx, I would group like terms together on the left-hand side. So I've got dy by dx is on the left-hand side. Everything else can move to the right. So I'll factorise the left in the same line. So 2x squared take away 16xy dy by dx. And the minus 8y squared can move to the right-hand side and the 4xy can move to the right-hand side as well. Okay, and then I can divide through by this bracket, so dy by dx would be 8y squared take away 4xy over 2x squared minus 16xy. And of course you can divide top and bottom by 2, or you could have done it earlier, that's fine. 4y squared take away 2xy over x squared minus 8xy. So that's your dy by dx. And from that, you could be asked to find stationary points, so where the numerator is equal to 0, because dy by dx needs to be 0. Or you could find points where the curve is uh, perpendicular to the x-axis or parallel to the y-axis, and that will be when the denominator is 0. So let's say I was asked to find where the stationary points were, or stationary point. So dy by dx would need to be 0. I would write that down. So that would mean that the 4y squared minus 2xy would have to be 0. So I would divide through by 2. So 2y squared minus xy is 0. And then I'll rearrange this to get x equals. I'll add the xy to both sides. I'll divide through by y. And so I would get x is equal to 2y squared divided by y, so 2y. Now, the reason why I can divide through by y there is because I know that y can't be 0. Because if y was 0, if I substitute y 0 into the left-hand side, I would get 0, take away 0, is equal to minus 1, which is, of course, nonsense. So that means that y cannot be 0, and so I can divide through it without losing any solutions. So I know that x is equal to 2y when there are stationary points. So I can now substitute that into the original equation. So I would have two lots of 2y squared times y. Take away 8 lots of 2y times y squared is equal to minus 1. So I would have 8y cubed 
take away 16y cubed is equal to minus 1. So minus 8y cubed would be equal to minus 1. So y cubed would be equal to 1 over 8. So y is going to be equal to 1 half. And if y is equal to 1 half, when x is 2y, that means that your stationary point will be x is 2 lots of 1 half, and the y value is 1 half. So that's your stationary point, 1, 1 half. Now, what's important to note is that if the question had just said, find the stationary points of the curve, there's no reason as to why you can't go straight in at this line and then say dy by dx is equal to 0. So you do not have to rearrange this to get dy by dx equals 2 in order to find stationary points. Because you know that dy by dx is equal to 0, you can substitute dy by dx is 0 in here. So that would make that term 0 and that term 0, and you would get 4xy take away 8y squared must be equal to 0. Okay? And that is precisely what you have here in the top line, which I've then simplified here. Okay? So you could go straight to 4 x, y, take away 8, y squared is equal to 0. After, of course, you've stated stationary points exist when dy by dx is 0. And then from there, go straight into that. OK? So that skips out a couple of lines of working where things could potentially go wrong. Now, parametric differentiation. If we've got x is sine of 2t and y equals cosine of 2t, uh, sorry, cosine of t, for example, then dx by dt would be 2 cosine of 2t. And if y is equal to cosine of t, then dy by dt is equal to minus sine of t. Now, dy by dx for parametric differentiation just uses the chain rule. That is dy by dt times by dt by dx. Now, an alternative way of writing that, which some people quite like, is dy by dt over dx by dt. So that would be minus sine of t over 2 cosine of 2t. Now, as a reminder, don't forget, Whenever you're working with calculus, you must make sure that your calculator is in radians. So if this question uh, had another bit where it said, find the gradient of the tangent when t is equal to pi over 3, make sure your calculator is in radians, and then you can substitute t as pi over 3 into that and evaluate. Okay? So um, with these types of questions, think about stationary points, think about tangents, um, but you won't be expected to go into the second derivatives um, with either of these cases, with implicit or parametric. So um, you can still find stationary points, you can still find tangents, and you can evaluate whether a curve's increasing or decreasing at a certain point, but nothing to do with second derivatives. So we move on to integration. And the fundamental theorem of calculus is the first thing mentioned in the specification on this. Now, the fundamental theorem of calculus essentially joins differentiation and integration together and explains that they are reverse processes of one another. So, essentially, if you are integrating f of x between a and b, then if f of x can be integrated as a function, then it would be written as, let's say, capital F of x, and we evaluate that between a and b, we put in square brackets, and that would be f of b take away f of a. Now I've introduced this new function, capital F of x. Now what is that? Well, if I differentiate capital F of x, I should get back to lowercase f of x. This links together differentiation and integration, explains how they are reverse processes of one another. Okay? So essentially, 
there's nothing kind of like new that you need to know here. It's something that you probably inherently now understand having gone through differentiation integration. They are reverse processes of one another. Now you need to be able to integrate standard functions. So for AS, we're just focusing on the integral of x to the n dx. And we know that we need to add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. And we need to add on a constant of integration. But remember, that rule does not work if n is minus 1. So n is not equal to minus 1 here. OK. e to the kx dx will integrate to 1 over k e to the kx plus a constant of integration. 1 over x, so that is the case when n is minus 1, integrates to the natural log of mod x plus c. Sine of kx, or well, sine goes to minus cosine, so that's been minus 1 over k cosine of kx plus c. And cosine of kx will integrate to 1 over k sine of kx plus c. Now, over here, right, this is what's in the formula booklet. I've included this here, although this comes under differentiation, because you can work it in reverse. Because if you've got the integral of sec squared, then you know that's got to be tan x. And the integral of minus cosec x cot x is cosec x. The integral of sec x tan x is sec x. And the integral of minus cosec squared x is cot x. They're there to be used should that question arise. Now we've also got the integration by parts formula. More on that in a moment. You've also got this, f prime over f, which is really useful. Always keep an eye out for that with integration. So if you've got a fraction... Um, and you're integrating a fraction, a rational expression, then check, does the denominator differentiate to the numerator, or multiple thereof? Okay, then you can use that fact there. And then, you've also got that tan x integrates to the natural log of sec x, mod sec x plus c, and cot x integrates to the natural log of mod sin x plus c. So we know that we can use integration to find areas. And let's say that I want to find the area between these two curves. So I've got y is equal to x squared, which is this one that is on top and then goes below y equals x cubed. y equals x cubed is the one that's below here. And we're integrating between 0 and 1. Well, I know that... If I integrate x squared between 0 and 1 dx, then I understand that that is going to give me the area between the x-axis and the curve between 0 and 1. And so it would give me all of that. But I don't want this bit here, so I would need to subtract the integral between 0 and 1 of x cubed dx. And the integral of x cubed dx would give me this region here. And so if I do that, take away that, I should be able to then work out what the area of that strip is. Now, um, you should know that if you've got two integrals like this where the limits are the same, you can combine them. And so this is the integral of 0 to 1 of x squared take away x cubed dx. And that's generally easier to work with uh, because you've, you're not going to have two sets of square brackets and lots of brackets thereafter. Okay, You can do it all in one go. And so you're going to put your answer into square brackets. 1 third x cubed take away 1 quarter x to the 4 evaluated between 0 and 1. So substitute in the 1, okay, you might want to set up a bracket, 1 third, take away 1 quarter, and then take away substituting in 0, 0 take away 0, so we get 1 third take away 1 quarter, so that's 4 twelfths uh, take away 3 twelfths, so that would be 1 twelfth. So when you're actually finding an area using a definite integral, and let's say you want to find the area between A and B here, then essentially what's going on is that we are splitting this area up into strips. And they're rectangular strips, 
Okay, and each one, because the original curve is y is equal to f of x, each one will have a height and a respective value of x between a and b of, well, f of x. You substitute the respective x into f, that tells you the height of the rectangle. Now, each of those rectangles will have a width of delta x, a little bit of x, okay? So... All of them will have the same uh, width because we'll split them up into the same width rectangles uh, for convenience. So this is the area of one of those rectangles. And I'm going to add all of those together. And I'm going to let delta x tend to zero. What that does is it makes the width of each of those rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you're adding up an infinite number of infinitesimally thin rectangles and that will give you the integral of f of x with respect to x between a and b. So the two big methods of integration that we learned were substitution and parts. So integration by substitution, um, here are some examples of ones you could do by substitution. So the integral of 2x plus 1 to the 5 dx, for example. Uh, you could also use reversing the chain rule on that. Um, or you could have the integral of, let's say, x e to the x squared dx. That would be an integration by substitution. Let u is equal to x squared. Let u be 2x plus 1 in that case. But both of those also could be done by reversing the chain rule. Um, you could have, let's say, um, you could do the integral of uh, x over x take away 1 with respect to x using integration by substitution, letting u be the x minus 1. OK, now there will be questions that will say use integration by substitution. Here is the substitution. The first thing you should do, OK, whenever you get your substitution. So let's say we're working with that one. U is equal to X minus one. First thing you do is you differentiate it. Right. So you do DU by DX and that's going to be equal to one in this case. And then you rearrange that to get your dx and now you've got a replacement for the dx. So in this case I've got a replacement for the dx, I've got a replacement for the x minus 1, but I don't have a replacement for the x, so I go back and rearrange this one to get u plus 1. So now I've got u plus 1 over u du. Okay, simplify that by writing it as u over u, which is 1. 1 over u, which is 1 over u, du, and then integrating from there. Okay, So once you're doing integration by substitution, you should get into a rigorous way of how you set your work out. So you start off with the substitution, you differentiate it, you rearrange, and then you check, do I need to go back to the substitution to make a rearrangement? Sometimes you do, which in this case you would. In these cases, you wouldn't. Okay, You wouldn't need to do that. OK, so only go back and rearrange that substitution if you need to. Integration by substitution questions can be quite bulky, but just keep practicing at them. Get into a routine of how you lay your work out. And that's exactly what you should also do for integration by parts. But of course, integration by parts, the formula is given to you in the formula booklet. So there's no reason as to why you shouldn't be able to use the formula correctly if you know what you need to get. So within the formula, this is the question, this is your answer. Okay, so what you need is a u, you need du by dx, you need a dv by dx, and you need a v. So if you get used to setting out your work in that way, then you should be able to collect your pieces so you identify the u and the dv by dx first, you differentiate that one, you integrate that one, and then you substitute those bits into the formula. How do you work out what the u should be? Well, you should use late. So L is for logarithms. Okay, so if you see a log logarithm, then u should be that. 
If there's no logarithms, then the next thing you should choose is A, which is for algebra. So example of this would be uh, integral of, let's say, x squared ln x dx. What should be the u? Well, because there's a logarithm, that should be the u. u is log x. The, the dv by dx would be the x squared. If the integral was x e to the x, then there are no logarithms. So the next one is algebra. So x will be the u, and the e to the x will be the dv by dx. OK? So you should spot integration by parts questions fairly easily by the fact that you're going to have two terms, OK, that are multiplied together, because integration by parts is the reverse of the product rule. Um, the only one where it's not as obvious is the integral of log x, which is the integral of log x times 1. OK, so what will u be? It'll be log x. What will the dv by dx be? It'll be the 1. So in each of these cases, you've got something times something. And you wouldn't be able to use substitution on them because the interior function that you've got here wouldn't differentiate back to what you've got at the front. So you can't use substitution on them. You wouldn't be able to go, well, x is equal to u, in which case you'd have the integral of u sine u du. Okay? It wouldn't make any difference to the difficulty of the problem. So you're looking for... Um, Two things multiplied together, so two terms multiplied together, where the interior function of this does not differentiate back to what you've got at the front. So you can see that these two look very similar, but the x squared differentiates to a multiple of the x, whereas the x does not differentiate to a multiple of x. So you can see that these are different. This is substitution or reversing the chain rule. This one is by parts. Now, sometimes you're going to have to use partial fractions uh, to integrate a rational expression like this. But the first thing that you should do is you should check, does the denominator differentiate to the numerator? So x squared plus 3x plus 2 differentiates to 2x plus 3, which is not what we've got in the numerator. Okay? And we don't, it's not a multiple in the numerator either. Okay? So... That means we can't use the integral of f prime over f, okay? which, remember, that's in the formula booklet. So that method's out. So that means we've got to look at partial fractions. That's the only other method available to us. So then you want to factorise the denominator. So that would be x plus 1, x plus 2. Okay, and then... The 2x plus 1 over x plus 1, x plus 2, you'll be able to write as something over x plus 1 plus something over x plus 2. And then you're going to be able to integrate that. Okay, So you need to work out the values of a and b first, and then integrate that, and that will answer the problem. Okay, So that is where you'll need to use partial fractions. Now, some differential equations we stand alone. Some will be within context. Okay, So... Um, if you are asked to form a differential equation, that will be from uh, a paragraph of text, and you will need to be able to figure out what the differential equation will need to be. So that is where we're going to be talking about um, whether you've got direct proportion or inverse proportion. So maybe the rate at which a population P is changing with respect to time, so dP by dt, is, uh, let's say, proportional to the population at a given time. So proportional to, so k times the population. And so you're taking a sentence uh, or a paragraph and then converting it into a differential equation that you may then go on to solve. OK, so it takes a little bit of practice, but, um, you know, once you're there, it should be OK. Then, solving basic differential equations like dy by dx equals f of x, well, 
let's say it's dy by dx is equal to x squared, right? Well, that's quite straightforward. You just integrate. y will be equal to 1 third x cubed plus a constant c. So you just integrate both sides. There's nothing special about that. So the dy by dx equals some function of x could be in an AS paper. OK? And then you might be given a condition. So let's say that the curve goes through the point um, 1, 2, work out the value of c. So you then need to work out the constant of integration. However, then you've got a second year technique of separating the variables. So this is when you have something like dy by dx is equal to, let's say, uh, x cubed over y. OK, so when you've got something like that, then you want to rearrange it first. So y dy, so get all the y's onto the left hand side and all the x's onto the right. And then integrate both sides. OK, so that is the separation of variables. Then we integrate both sides. So 1 half y squared is equal to 1 quarter x to the 4. And you add your constant of integration to the right hand side. Then you might be given some initial conditions or boundary condition allowing you to work out the value of c. So the curve goes through uh, 1, 2 again. Okay, Substitute 1 and 2 in. Um, x is 1, y is 2 into that. Work out your value of c. Okay, So um, yeah, separating the variables again could include uh, any of your integration techniques. So it could include integration by substitution, by parts, uh, other standard functions. Um, could also include partial fractions. So let's say I was asked to show that x cubed take away 4x plus 2 equals 0 has a root between x equals 1 and x equals 2. So I would use the change of sign method to do that. So the first thing I would do is I would let f of x be x cubed take away 4x plus 2. So I would define what f is. Then I want to find f of 1 and f of 2. OK, so I've got 1 take away 4 plus 2, so minus 1. And then I've got 8 uh, take away 8 plus 2, so 2. Right. So this one is negative. This one is positive. So then I need a concluding statement. As there is a change of sign and the function is continuous, so you need to identify that it is continuous, then there is a root, at least one root, between x equals 1 and x equals 2. So usually what you'll see is that you'll have this part A where the question says, show that x cubed take away 4x plus 2 equals 0 has a root between 1 and 2. And then you use the change of sign method to do that. And then part B would be something like show that this can be written in the form of x equals some function of x, so x equals g of x, and then you turn it into an iterative form, and then you can home in on the root. Alternatively, that part b might be use the newton raphson method. Okay, So, for example, we go back to x cubed take away 4x plus 2 equals 0. Maybe the question asks you to rearrange it into the form x cubed is equal to uh, 4x take away 2. And then x is equal to the cube root of 4x take away 2. OK, and then they want you to use x0 is equal to 1. And we write this in an iterative form, xn plus 1 is equal to the cube root of 4xn take away 2. And then we substitute in 1, we get x1, then we substitute that in, we get x2, and then you can use your answer key on your calculator to do, to do that, okay, to do that quickly. Now, pictorially, what's going on is you've got the y equals x line. And now, I don't know exactly what this curve looks like, so I'm just going to draw a generic curve, something that looks like that. 
and you have your starting point, so x0, then you go up to the curve, line, curve, line, curve, line, curve, line, and you home in on the root. And this is a staircase diagram. Now you should label that as x1, then x2, then x3, and you should make sure that you use a ruler when you're doing it. So that would be a staircase diagram. Alternatively, you might see a cobweb diagram. So here's the y equals x line, and here is the curve. So here is your starting position, let's say. So you go up to the curve, line, curve, line, curve, line, curve, line, curve, line, and it homes in on the root. So this is your x1, there is your x2, there's your x3, etc. So whether you get a staircase or a cobweb diagram is down to the shape of the curve at the point that you are considering. So if it has positive gradient, then you get a staircase diagram. If it's got negative gradient, you'll have the cobweb diagram. Now you'll notice that it did not home in on that root, but it did home in on that root. That's because the gradient of the curve at the point I'm interested in here is less than one. So it's between so the, the gradient of the curve at the root needs to be between minus 1 and 1 in order for it to home in. Here, it's greater than 1 because it's going above the line, so it's too steep. So that kind of gives you a recap of um, the x equals g of x method. Keep an eye out for fail cases. Um, take a look back at the playlist for that. Now, the newton raphson method, the newton raphson method is given to you in the formula booklet. It looks like this. So what we need is f of x and f prime of x. So f of x, of course, is the x cubed take away 4x plus 2. Let's keep with that example. f prime of x, we differentiate 3x squared take away 4. So then we can write down the iterative form. xn plus 1 is equal to xn take away xn cubed take away 4xn plus 2. Make sure you've got the n's there, and you've got 3xn squared take away 4. And we're starting with x0 is 1, for example. And then I can substitute that in, and I can get x1, x2, whatever we need. Again, keep an eye out for fail cases, um, especially if the denominator here could be 0 at one of the points, at the starting point. So that means you're starting at a stationary point. You also need to know what, pictorially, the newton raphson method is doing. You might need to demonstrate it in the exam. So, let's say you've got a curve that looks like that. Um, let's actually need the root. Okay, so there's the root here. That's what we're trying to get to. And uh, let's say we're starting up here. So here's my x0. So I go up to the curve. And then you want to use a ruler, and you're going to draw a tangent to the curve at that point. And then that is going to be your x1. Then you want to go up to the curve, and then you're going to draw another tangent. Now you can see my, my one's going to shoot off. Okay, uh, But you're going to want a tangent line that's then going to intersect your x-axis. My drawing wasn't a particularly good example, but you can see what you need to do. Okay, so you may need to demonstrate the newton raphson method within an exam question. Now, the trapezium rule formula is given to you in the formula booklet. Okay, so there's no reasons to why you should get this wrong. So, really, with the trapezium rule, you just want to get used to a rigorous way of laying out your work. So, let's say we go with something easy to work with. Let's go with e to the x dx, and we're integrating between 0 and 1, and let's go with uh, four strips, or four intervals, if you like, okay? So, what you then want to do is work out h. So, h is going to be equal to, now it's b take away a, so the limits there of the integral, 1 take away 0, and n is the number of strips. So we're going up in quarters. You then want to build a table of results. So x and y. You start at the lower limit and you go up in quarters, okay, in values of h. So a quarter, 
a half, three quarters, and then one. You stop when you get to your upper limit. Now notice how you've got one, two, three, four, five. These are five ordinates. So you always have one more ordinate than strip. They're essentially the posts of a fence and strips of the panels. Okay, you can kind of think of it like that. So then you substitute each of those values into your function. So you have e to the zero, which is one, e to the quarter, e to the half, e to the three quarters, e to the one. And then we need to substitute it into the formula. So the area is going to be approximately one half times by h, which is a quarter, times by, we've got the first plus the last, one plus e, plus two lots of y1 plus y2. So that's the rest of them. So e to the quarter, e to the half, e to the three quarters. Now you need to put that in your calculator and evaluate it. Okay. Now my suggestion is that uh, some people just try to write it all into their calculator in one go. I don't do that. The, what I do first is I work out what that bracket is, press equals, then double it, press equals, then I add on those two terms, press equals, and then I multiply by a quarter and then multiply by a half. Okay. So I work from the inside out, evaluating it as I go. And that, I often find, leads to less errors. So with vectors, you need to be adaptable to the different ways of being able to write them down. So be aware that you can write a column vector like 2 minus 3 in component form as 2i take away 3j. Make sure you underline the i and the j when you're writing it out. So there's a 2d vector. And if you want it as a 3d vector, then let's say we've got 2 minus 3, 4. So then that would be 2i take away 3j plus 4k. So um, you need to be happy with writing it in either column vector form or component form. Now you should know that when we work out the magnitude of a vector, we should be using Pythagoras' theorem. So if it's just a 2D vector like this, we write the magnitude of A using the modular signs is equal to the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, and so that would be root 5. This is easily extended to three dimensions, so we'll have the square root of 3 squared plus 1 squared plus minus 1 squared. So that's 9, 10, 11. So this is root 11. Now, the direction of a vector, now you should, I would advise very strongly that you have a supporting diagram, okay, so that you are showing what angle you are talking about here. So um, you might, when you do this, so two along, one up, so be something like that. So two along, one up. Now you may well find that angle there as the direction. So theta here would be arctan of 1 over 2. So opposite over adjacent. Alternatively, when you do this, you might uh, write it as a bearing and find the angle that's there. It really depends on if the question asks for it. So if the question asks for um, find the bearing of the vector, then of course you will find that angle and write it to three figures, okay, using a three figure bearing. If it says find the angle that the vector makes with the, uh, with I, okay, with the horizontal axis, then you would be looking for theta here, okay? Um, if it just says find the direction of the vector, then it's best to include your diagram and then make sure that you're clear about what angle you are finding, okay? Just to make it clear to the examiner. Now, a question that says find the resultant vector, you need to know that that means I need to add the vectors together. So that's the same uh, when it comes up with forces, find the resultant force, you combine the forces. So. If we had a is equal to 2i plus 3j and b is equal to minus i uh, plus j, find the resultant of the two vectors would mean a 
plus b. And so that would be 2 take away 1, so i, 3 plus 1 for j. OK, so you need to understand what that means geometrically and what's going on. So visually, we've got the vector a is 2i plus 3j, so 2 along 3 up. So here is a, 2 along, let's, let's write it there, 2 along and 3 up. There's a, and then you've got b, which is minus i plus j, so 1 along 1 up, so something like that. There is b. So what is a plus b? Well, that's i plus 4j. So essentially you're going along a and then you're travelling along b. So that gets you to this point here. So that's actually 1 along and 4 up. That is what that vector is saying. So you should understand kind of geometrically what's going on. And when we have a scalar multiple, let's say we've got, um, let's say, 2a. Well, that is just multiplying this vector through by 2, of course, so 4i plus 6j. So what we've got there is a vector that is parallel to it, but now twice the length. So if that's a, then 2a would be that vector there, okay, doubling its length. So let's say we've got two points, a and b. So 2, 0, 1, and b is minus 1, 1, 0. Okay, now the position vector for a is o, a. Now you can write that as a column vector or a uh, in component form. I'm going to write it as a column vector, so 2, 0, 1. And the position vector for B is OB. So a position vector tells you how to get from the origin to the coordinate. So minus 1, 1, 0. Now if you want to find the vector A to B, so remember that if you've got your point A here and you've got your point B here, then to get from A to B, draw that very well, the way I can do that is I can go, right, well, here is the origin. I need to go from A to the origin, and then from O to B. So that is the same as OB minus OA, because remember, that arrow is going from A to O, which is the opposite of OA. So it's always OB minus OA. So if you need to find the vector uh, ST, it's OT minus OS. If you need to find the vector CP, then it's OP minus OC. OK, so the vector AB is going to be OB minus OA. Minus 1 take away 2 is minus 3. 1 take away 0 is 1. 0 take away minus 1 is minus 1. So 0 take away 1 is minus 1. So that's my vector AB. Now, find the distance between those two points, a and b. Well, I found the vector a, b, so I just now need to find its length. So I find the modulus of a, b, square root of minus 3 squared plus 1 squared plus minus 1 squared. So 9, 10, 11, so root 11. So we reach statistics. So you need to understand the difference between what we mean by a population and by a sample. OK, so the idea is that we can take a sample and then we can make an inference. We can infer something about that population. OK, so the population is everybody. So if you sent a form, a questionnaire, out to everyone in the population um, then, uh, and expected them all to take part, then that would be a census. OK, so a census collects data from the whole population. However, um, most common is that we take a sample and uh, there are many different sampling methods and you need to know all of these sampling methods and what they are and their pros and cons. So first up we've got simple random sampling. So this is where you have a list of the whole population and then what you do is you use a random number generator to select 
your sample. So essentially you've got a list of all the people, you've numbered them all from one to however many people there are in the list, and then you use a random number generator to select numbers at random, um, ignoring repeats. So you need to be able to explain that. Don't mention picking names from a hat, okay? So don't do that, use a um, random number generator. Right, systematic sampling. So we've got all our population in the list, okay? Um, what we need to do first is we need to select a point at random to start. So we could use a, no a random number generator to do that. And then uh, we are going to go every fourth along or every tenth along, depending on how many you need in your sample, okay? So let's say there were 200 people in your population and you wanted to take a sample of size 10, then you would do 200 divided by 10, so I need to pick every 20th person. So you randomly generate where you're gonna start and then pick every 20th person, okay? This is very good for like on a conveyor belt. So if you've got a conveyor belt of items coming along, then you can pick every 10th item up and check that over. Stratified sampling. Okay, so you've got your list of your population and they split up nicely into groups. Um, so it may well be like you've got uh, students at a sixth form college, you've got year 12 and year 13, for example. Um, so they are distinct groups, they don't overlap. Um, and then you're going to go, right, I want a proportional representation of how many of people from year 12 and year 13 to complete my questionnaire. Okay, so uh, you have non-overlapping groups that you're then able to proportionally, proportionally select a sample from. Cluster sampling, um, this is where um, groups uh, naturally form into clusters. So for example, if we keep with the sixth form college route and we say A-level maths classes, each of those A-level maths classes would be a cluster. Okay, you could think of it as a cluster. Um, so if you wanted to uh, send a questionnaire out to students who do A-level maths, then uh, you could randomly select a cluster or randomly select some clusters. Uh, so select some classes. Then you can either send the questionnaire out to everyone in that cluster, or you can then do a simple random sample from within that cluster. It depends uh, how many you need and how many people you need to do your questionnaire um, and yeah, so how many you really want. Opportunity convenience sampling. So from here on out, we no longer have a list of the whole population. So simple random sampling, systematic, stratified and cluster all require a list of the whole population that you're going to sample from. Okay, the remaining ones do not. So opportunity convenience sampling would be um, me going out onto the street, um, let's say into the high street of a shopping centre and uh, selecting people at random to complete a questionnaire. Okay, so that would be opportunity convenience sampling because I'm selecting the people who walk past me. It's convenient. Um, or if I want to take a, a straw poll, for example, um, let's say I wanted to um, uh, get the ideas from an A-level maths group, um, right, oh, there's an A-level maths group over there, I'll go and select those. That's convenient. I can just go walk over there and uh, ask them. Quota sampling is where you uh, have a quota of how many you want to fill. So let's say... Um, you want 20 year 12 students and 20 year 13 students, okay? Um, there's no, they don't have to be proportional, so it's not like stratified sampling, and I don't need to have a list of the whole population. I can just pick 20 year 12, 20 year 13, and I could do that via an opportunity sample. So as they walk by, I can pick them up then, okay? And uh, select them that way for my sample. Self-selection or volunteer sampling, so it'd be like sending an email out uh, to a cohort and going, right, could you uh, complete this questionnaire? And what you get, uh, really the only, the, the only people that reply to your questionnaire are the people who want to reply to the questionnaire, and hence that can lead to some bias, okay? So self-selection or volunteer sampling, um, 
the people themselves have decided to opt in to do that questionnaire to give their feedback. And so in all likelihood, when you do a sampling like that, then you get the strongest opinions coming through. Okay, so you need to know all of those sampling methods. You need to be able to describe them. You need to be able to describe their advantages and disadvantages. Now I've done separate videos that go through the AQA large data set and the Edexcel large data set. So um, if you want to look those up, then you can. Essentially, my advice for the large data set is that you should go into the exam uh, having an understanding of the factual information there. Obviously, you're not meant to remember all of the numbers or any kind of specific numbers that are part there. Um, but if data is missing, you should really have an understanding as to why. Um, and especially with the AQA large data set, you need to make sure you know about units, uh, the types of cars that are there, etc. OK, so take a look at those videos if you want a little bit more detail. But um, remember, it's just the factual knowledge you need. You need to be able to interpret the diagrams of single variable data. So that would include box plots, cumulative frequency graphs, and histograms. So with box plots, um, very similar to what you do at GCSE, there are some differences um, in how it's presented because it also includes outliers. Okay, so make sure that you understand uh, what it means when you see a box plot like this and you've got these crosses here. So these crosses represent outliers and that reflects um, how you calculate outliers using the quartiles. Okay, so you need to make sure you know how to do that. Cumulative frequency graphs, again, you should be able to estimate the median and quartiles and if required percentiles for a cumulative frequency curve. So cumulative frequency curve often looks something like that. And then if you want the median position, you're going to go, right, if that goes up to 100, say, then you go to 50. So you go along to your curve, go down, and then estimate your median from there. Make sure you use a ruler when you're doing this. Upper quartile from 75, da, 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 go along to the curve, then down, read off your upper quartile. Lower quartile at 25 like so. And when I talk about uh, percentiles, maybe it's the 10th percentile. So going up to 10, go along to the curve and read down. OK, so you could do it as percentiles as well. Histograms. With histograms, uh, you need to understand that the area is proportional to the frequency. OK, so you might get asked, uh, for example, a question where it says something like this bar represents this many people, it's got this width and this height. Okay, uh, then you've got this other bar needs to be drawn that has the rep needs to represent this many people and it's got this width. What does the height need to be? Okay, so you've got enough information there to be able to work out the height. So it may be that kind of problem. It may be a problem where you've got the frequency, uh, sorry, the histogram drawn, and you're then needing to work out the probability of getting between two certain values. Okay, so you're looking at using the areas of the histogram. Okay, so it can be linked into probabilities there as well. Now you're expected to be able to interpret scatter graphs or scatter diagrams um, from a basic point of view of being able to identify positive correlation, no correlation or negative correlation. Really you should talk about um, a strength involved there, but usually that comes in when we're talking about the PMCC as well. Uh, so is it strong positive correlation? Is it weak negative correlation, etc. And when you're interpreting scatter graphs, um, Make sure that you read the context of the problem um, and see whether the scatter graph is how you would expect it to be. Um, and also um, scatter graphs that kind of can fool you as well. So remember, look for things like where you've got data sets like this. So it looks like positive correlation, but actually it could probably be two distinct um, populations that have been graphed together. 
Okay, um, so it looks like there's a positive correlation, but actually maybe there isn't. Okay, uh, may, may, well, maybe there it it could be interpreted as positive correlation, of course, but maybe um, interpreting it, you might go, well, actually that's not quite what it's showing. Okay, so I've got I'm just being a little bit careful with what I say. Now, this statement here really useful to remember. Remember that correlation does not imply causation. So just because there is a correlation does not imply that one thing is causing the other. Okay? It may well be the case that one thing is ca causing the other. Okay? Or it could be the other way around. Or it could be that there is no cause whatsoever between the two things. They're, to, they're two so completely different things that one thing could not cause the other. Or there could be a third factor at play. Okay, so keep an eye on these and think about, um, you know, if the question says, uh, can we say that because the correlation, because there is a correlation, that this implies this or this causes this? Think about how you're going to answer that and remember that statement. Now. The product moment correlation coefficient, the PMCC, you need to remember that it goes between minus 1 and 1. And minus 1 means perfect negative correlation, 1 means perfect positive correlation. You should be able to calculate the PMCC and also the equation of the regression line, uh, which, remember, is the best line of best fit using your calculator. So on your calculator, you should be able to type in your data and then work out R and work out the A and the B, so that's your R value, and Y is equal to AX plus B, or A plus BX. Um, so that will be able to work out the gradient and the Y-intercept of your regression line, okay, on your calculator. It may well be that the question has... Um, a graph that's drawn, something like that, a scatter graph that's drawn, and you've got uh, to estimate what the value of R is. So take a punt at what you think the value of R is. Um, or it might be, can you match up the value of R? So it could be a multiple choice question on an AQA paper, for example. Here are some values of R. Here's the graph, which is the R, which value of R goes with uh, the graph. OK, so multiple ways that that question can be asked, but you're not going to be expected to do much calculation with the regression line itself, but just make sure that you know that you can calculate it if required. So with measures of central tendency and variation, what we mean is the mean and standard deviation and the median and interquartile range. OK, so with the mean, you should know that that is represented by x bar, and that is the sum of all your x's divided by how many there are. So sum of x divided by n. So if you are uh, given the summary statistics, so what we mean by that is if you're given n, the sum of x, the sum of x squared, you should be able to work out the mean, and you should be able to work out the standard deviation. Okay, so the standard deviation formula is given to you in the formula booklet, both versions, so this is in the AQA formula booklet. This one we don't use that often. Um, it's kind of superseded by this, uh, which can be used with the summary statistics. You should be able to work out the mean and standard deviation straight on your calculator. Uh, remember that on your calculator um, for the class whiz, um, the standard deviation is represented by lowercase sigma, and the sample standard deviation is represented by s. Now, um, if you have uh, a sample um, taken from a population, you know it's a sample taken from a population, then theoretically, really, you should be using s okay, uh, to work out the standard deviation of that data. Um, AQA isn't too worried about which one you use, so if you're not too sure, then, you know, it won't really make that much difference, okay? Um, but in general, if you've got a sample taken from a population, it's within context, then S is what you should be using. Now, 
we call sigma squared the variance. So this is the variance. And S squared is the sample variance. OK, so what does the mean standard deviation do? Well, the mean obviously gives you an average and it's affected by all of the data that you have. So if you add on like a very large bit of data onto the end, then the mean will be affected. The standard deviation will be affected. Standard deviation takes into account all of the data items as well and tells you how spread out the data is. So if you've got a larger standard deviation, then that means the data is more spread out. If it's a smaller standard deviation, the data is more compacted, more consistent. Now, the median and interquartile range, again, your calculator uh, can work out the median, lower quartile, the upper quartile for you uh, from a data set. Now, note that um, if the data is grouped, and you were asked to find the median interquartile range, um, then you have to use linear interpolation in order to do that. Now, linear interpolation is not on AQA, A-level maths. Um, it doesn't get tested for AQA, but it is in Edexcel, for example. So double check with your uh, specification whether linear interpolation is included or not. But for AQA, it's not. Edexcel, it is. Um, so. With the interquartile range, IQR, that is the upper quartile, take away the lower quartile. And um, of course, this data could be represented via a box plot as well, uh, which we saw uh, previously. Now, the interpretation of the mean and in interquartile range um, is kind of similar to the mean standard deviation. The median, obviously, is your middle value, and the interquartile range tells you uh, is a measure of how spread out the data is. However, the difference is that for the median interquartile range, it is not affected by extreme values. So uh, if you've got a data set and let's say the last number is 10, okay, and I increase it to from 10 up to a million, right, the median interquartile range would not be affected. Okay, that wouldn't change. However, the mean and standard deviation definitely would because they're calculated based on all of the bits of data. Now, you need to be able to calculate the outliers uh, regardless of whether you're working with the mean and standard deviation or with the quartiles. Now, if you've got the mean and standard deviation, then we consider outliers to be outside of x bar take away two standard deviations and x bar plus two standard deviations. So it needs to be further than two standard deviations away from the mean. Now, that's the general way of doing it. Um, however, there are some people who might say it needs to be beyond three standard deviations from the mean. If there is a difference with it, it will tell you in the question. OK, so we'll just read the question carefully. So it might say, um, Jack uh, says that outliers uh, should be three standard deviations away from the mean, in which case I would need to change that to three. Okay. Right, now with the quartiles, the general way of doing it with quartiles is it needs to be outside of the lower quartile, take away 1.5 times the interquartile range, and the upper quartile plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Now, again, um, the 1.5 might be adjusted uh, within the question. Just read the question carefully. Now, it may well be that you need to uh, clean data or uh, suggest how data may, might actually be cleaned. Now, um, this is usually, I would say, going to be working with the large data set. And for example, with the AQA large data set for cars, um, there are some, it lists the masses of cars and some of them are zero, right? Which obviously you can't have zero mass for your car. So um, what you would then do is you would go, right, well, I'm going to ignore those ones and not include them. So I'm cleaning that data, okay? So some of the data uh, might be errors. Uh, that need to be cleaned away, or they might be just nothing there, okay, so we don't include them. Um, if they are outliers, then there may well be a question of, should I get rid of the outliers? 
because could they be an outlier because the data was recorded incorrectly or could it be that actually the data was recorded correctly and it is just an outlier should we include it or not so in some circumstances it may be appropriate to do so in other circumstances maybe not it really depends on the problem um, so just read the context carefully okay so we're going to move on to probability so you might want to pause the video here and answer these two questions a and b are mutually exclusive if a and b are independent if okay now you can't get these mixed up a and b are mutually exclusive if they cannot happen at the same time which means that the intersection of a and b must be zero a intersection b means there, what was the probability? Well, that's the event that they happen at the same time. So there's the probability of them happening at the same time. Zero. The Venn diagram would look like this. Okay. Now, A and B are independent if event A does not affect the probability of event B happening. Okay. And vice versa. So they have no effect upon one another. So it's like uh, drawing an ace from a pack of cards and rolling a six with a fair die. One event is not going to affect the probability of the other event occurring. Okay, so how can you write that down? Well, actually, if A and B are independent, then the probability of A intersection B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B okay that is if they are independent you also find of course that with conditional probability if the probability of A given B well what would that be if they're independent well it doesn't matter if B's happened or not it won't affect the probability of A so the probability of A intersection sorry the probability of A given B would be equal to the probability of A and the probability of B given A is the probability of B. Okay, so that is the difference between mutually exclusive and independent. Mutually exclusive, they can't happen at the same time. Independent, they can happen at the same time, right? But they won't affect one another. Now you should be well versed in utilizing Venn diagrams, tree diagrams, and two-way tables as part of probability. Now with Venn diagrams, maybe you should draw one given the information that you have, or uh, you might already have one drawn and then you're gonna work with the probabilities given there. You might be finding missing values. Now, you are given that the probability of A union B is the probability of A plus the probability of B take away probability of the intersection of A and B. That's given to you in the formula booklet, okay? Now, what that's directly referring to, of course, is if you've got your Venn diagram, A and B, then the union represents everything inside A and B. And of course, that's gonna be all of A plus all of B. But the problem is that you've counted the intersection twice, and so you need to subtract one of the intersections, okay? So that is where that formula comes from, and that's given to you in the formula booklet. It is quite useful. With tree diagrams, um, you know, if the question has kind of two stages, so um, there are two tests to be completed, they'll either pass or fail, for example, then draw a tree diagram out. You might be asked to draw one out. It might already be there. I don't know. It depends on the question. Okay. But... With a tree diagram, remember you multiply along the branches and then add up results at the end, whatever you need to do with it. Two-way tables, again, um, you know, quite bog standard. Um, you might have a student uh, does art, yes or no. And uh, you might have a student does maths, yes or no, right? And this counts how many of each uh, do maths and art. 
um, and then you could be asked probabilities based on that. Okay, and they could be conditional probabilities. So, what's the probability of a student doing maths given that they do art, for example? So, given that they do art, what's the probability of a student doing maths? Okay, so you can work it out fairly easily from a two way table. Now, the conditional probability is full A level maths, so this is not in AS. The formula here is given to you in the formula booklet, but I've always said I don't like the formula being written that way, um, and I don't use it really that way. And what is good, I guess, is that it reminds you of independence, because if A and B are independent, then the probability of B given A is just the probability of B. So if they're independent, then that's telling you the probability of A intersection B is the probability of A times the probability of B. Okay, But the conditional probability formula that I always use is the probability of A given B is the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of B. This is the one that I've always suggested that you learn and you work with. Now you need to be able to work with general discrete probability distributions. The binomial distribution is a specific type of discrete probability distribution. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So let's say um, we've got a discrete probability distribution here. Probability of x being equal to r is k times r when r is 1, 2, and 3, but it's 0 otherwise. So what that means is that r can only take on three values, 1, 2, and 3. If r were any other value, then the probability of x being equal to it would be 0. Now, when you're working with a discrete probability distribution like this, if it's written like that, you might find that it's easier to write in a table. So we put our values of r and the probability of x being equal to r. r can take on 1, 2, and 3. So we've got k times 1, when r is 1, then k times 2, then k times 3. Now, we need to know that the probabilities always add up to 1. So the sum of all of the probabilities must be equal to 1. So in our case, we've got k plus 2k plus 3k, which is 6k, must be equal to 1. So that tells me that k has to be 1 sixth. So we might need to find a value of k using this method. OK? Um, you can get more challenging problems where there might be two unknowns uh, or even three. Um, but one of the facts you should always use is this. So you might be given something like uh, the probability of x being equal to 1 is twice the probability of x being equal to 3, for example. OK, um, obviously not with that example there, but let's, let's just take that for an example. Then you could use that and you could use that fact there and it will probably set up some simultaneous equations to solve. OK, right now the binomial distribution. This is what you're given in the AQA formula booklet, this table. So we know that uh, for a binomial distribution, we've got two parameters N and P. So we have n independent trials with a fixed probability p. Okay. Now you may be asked to critique um, a situation as to whether a binomial distribution would be appropriate. So if, for example, you were talking about someone who was uh, practicing basketball and throwing a ball at the hoop, um, you would expect that the more times that they practice, the better they would get, the more likely they would be uh, to score. So you would, it would be unlikely that P would be fixed. Okay? So it might be that the binomial model would not be appropriate in that scenario. Okay? That's something you should be able to explain. You're given the formula for the uh, distribution. So NCR, or NCX in this case, times p to the x times 1 take away p to the n minus x. It's reasonably unlikely to say that you'll be asked to use that formula um, because you're, you're going to be expected to use your calculator to find any exact probability or cumulative probability. So if you're asked to find a probability of a, nor of a binomial distribution, just use your calculator. OK, don't don't use the formula. Then you're also given the mean and variance of the distribution. So 
Um, you're not... Uh, we don't go through the mean invariance of a general discrete probability distribution. That's devoted in uh, further maths. So we do that in further maths. But uh, you are given the mean invariance here. Now, the mean can be useful when you're working with uh, binomial hypothesis testing and you're trying to... Um, trying to determine kind of where you should be looking for the critical region, especially if you're using the class with. Um, the variance, um, I've seen algebraic problems come up from it. So let's say, for example, you have a binomial distribution. You don't know n, but you know the probability is 0.1. And you are told that the standard deviation is equal to 6, say then you know that the variance is the standard deviation squared, so that would be 36, is equal to n, we don't know that, times by p, which is 0 0.1, times by 1 minus p, which is 0 0.9. So you could solve that equation. So what would that be? That would be 400. OK, I think that's... 400, isn't it? So 36 divided by 0 0.1 times 0 0.9. Yeah. So n would be 400. So you might be asked something like that. OK? Um, but yes, use your calculator to find uh, probability of x being... So if you had something like this, binomial distribution, and it's 30 and 0 0.3, you should be able to find the probability of, of x being equal to 10, uh, probability of x being less than or equal to 9, for example, um, or probability of x being greater than 11. You should be able to find all these probabilities on your calculator. Um, if your... Um, if you find some of these a little bit challenging, especially something like probability of x being greater than 11, my suggestion to you would be to draw out a number line. So think of it this way. So here's your number line. And it goes from 0, 1, and then it goes up to, what do we want? Let's So up to 10, 11, 12, 13, yada, 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 up to 30. OK? So if you want greater than 11, you want all of those. So you want that. And so that's going to be equal to 1. So everything, take away the bit you don't want, which is less than or equal to 11. So if you're using the class with, uh, you can only find less than or equal to probabilities on it. So you would have to do that kind of calculation. If you've got the numworks, for example, then you could do that calculation straight off on that. So with the normal distribution, you should know what it looks like, and you should know that the mean sits right in the middle. So we use mu. And there are two parameters for the normal distribution, of course. X is a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared. So we write the variance in there. Now, you should know that the normal distribution, 99%, uh, 99.7%, in fact, is contained within three standard deviations of the mean. So this is a really good fact to remember. So three standard deviations either side, this would represent 99.7%. Other things that you should be aware of is that the point of inflection, or the points of inflection rather, so there and there, the points of inflection of the curve are precisely one standard deviation either side of the mean. OK, so you should recall that fact. Now, that can be calculated. So using the normal distribution curve equation, don't worry. You don't expect, you're not expected to remember that. Uh, it would be given to you in the exam uh, if you needed to do this. Uh, you can then differentiate it twice, and then you can find the points of inflection. And they work out to be one standard deviation either side. The thing is, that calculation is quite in-depth and quite tough, so I would expect that the problem would be simplified somewhat. Um, 
So maybe you've got to work with the standard normal rather than um, a general normal distribution curve. You'd be expected to find probabilities, so use your calculator to find probabilities. Um, make sure you're happy with using your calculator to find a probability of less than, greater than, or between. Um, and don't forget that the probability of x being equal to anything, so let's say, I don't know, uh, let's just put k, that's always going to be zero. And the probability of x being not equal to k would be 1. OK, so don't forget that. Now, if we don't know mu or sigma squared or both, then what we need to use is the standard normal distribution. So the standard normal distribution, z, is the normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1. And the coding formula that gets you to that is not given to you in the formula booklet, is z is equal to x take away mu over sigma. You need to know that, OK? So that is what you need to use if you don't have mu, or you don't have sigma squared, or you don't have both. If you don't have both, then the problem is going to become a simultaneous equation problem. OK? So essentially, you set up two equations using that and solve them. And that allows you to work out mu and sigma. Now, with hypothesis testing, you should be aware and be able to understand what each of these things mean. OK? So h0 and h1. h0 is the null hypothesis. So that is the initial statement that we, it's like the devil's advocate position, essentially. OK, so that is what we believe to be true. H1 is the alternative hypothesis. So that is what we are considering opposing the null hypothesis. So maybe we think um, the probability isn't equal to 1 sixth or is greater than 1 sixth or is less than 1 sixth. Or the mean value is greater than the mean value that we believe it to be. The significance level, you should understand and be able to write down the definition of the significance level. It is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it is true. OK, so it is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it is true. That is the significance level. You should be able to write that down word for word. The one or two tail test, so understanding what that means and how that influences the way that you go about the problem, um, and how with a two tail test that you must halve the significance level. Because you're looking at two tails, you've got that tail and that tail. If the significance level is 10%, then you want a 5% tail and a 5% tail. OK, because overall then it's a 10% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it's true. Now, the critical value and the critical region, we're looking at the values that would reject the null hypothesis. OK, so when we talk about the critical region, then these are the values. So it might be x is equal, greater than or equal to 11. So 11 up to 20, for example. These are the values of x that would reject the null hypothesis. So if we observed any of those, we would reject. Whereas the acceptance region would be from 0 up to 10. If 11 up to 20 was the uh, critical region, then 0 up to 10 would be the acceptance region. This is the region where you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, when we work with binomial hypothesis testing, you can work with the critical region method, or you can use a p-value method, okay, where you look at a particular probability and you test that p-value against the significance level. So maybe you find the probability of x being less than or equal to 10 to be 0.054 and you've got a 5% significance level, so, oh, it's not under the significance level. So if your p-value is less than the significance level, then you reject the null hypothesis. OK? So that's how we define the bits and pieces that we have within a hypothesis test. So the binomial hypothesis test starts with let p 
be the probability of. Okay, so it might be let P be the probability of scoring a six on a fair die or something like that, or scoring a six on a die. Um, then you're going to go into your null hypothesis and then your alternative hypothesis and then you assume H0 is true and you set up your binomial distribution and then if you are working with a p-value method then you are going to then find the probability of x being let's say less than or equal to 10. Now the direction of that arrow should match what you've got here. Okay so if that's greater than that should be greater than or equal to. Okay you work out that probability, you compare it against the significance level. So let's say that this was 0.054, and then if we're working with a 5% significance level, well, that's greater than 5%. So the result is not significant, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and then we must write a concluding statement in context that is non-committal. Okay? Um, now, if you're using a critical region method, you're asked to find the critical region, then um, you can use your calculator to do that. Go back to the videos and see how it can be done using the calculator. So if the critical region was, um, let's say it was uh, 0 to 9, for example, then, oh, 10 isn't in the critical region, right? So we failed to reject the null hypothesis, okay? And so then we write our concluding statement. So it's a very similar uh, setup, uh, but it's just finding the critical region and comparing 10 with it, rather than finding the probability of x being less than or equal to 10 and comparing that probability against the significance level. Now for sample means hypothesis testing with a normal distribution, we start off by stating let mu be the population mean of and then we write that in context, okay? Then we have the null hypothesis where mu is equal to some value. H1 mu is less than or greater than or not equal to that value. Then we've got assume H0 is true. And we set up a normal distribution for the sample means. So it has the same mean as we have here. The variance is sigma squared over n because there will be a sample size within the question. It'll tell you the sample size. And then you need to find the probability of x bar being less than if it matches that or greater than if that's greater or it could be less than or greater than if that's not equal to it's a two-tailed test because you're looking at make sure you're always looking away from the mean just like it is with binomial hypothesis testing as well okay so if your probability so this is using the p-value method here if the probability that you get let's say is 0. I don't know, 0, 2, and it's a 5% significance level. Oh, well, that's less than a 5% significance level. So the result is significant, and so we reject the null hypothesis because the p-value is less than the significance level. And then we write a conclusion in context that is non-committal, just like we would with the binomial. Now, in the formula booklet, in the AQA formula booklet, it has this. For a random sample of n observations from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared, you have x bar take away mu over sigma over root n is normally distributed with a mean 0 and variance 1. Now, this is the formula for z, the standard normal. That's why you've got n with 0 and 1 here. So that is z when we're working with the sample means because you've got the sample mean that you've got there take away the population mean divided by the standard error so remember sigma over root n is the standard error so you could use this to convert to uh, the standard normal and then find the, pop the uh, probability that way
and compare that against the significance level. You could do that. Personally, I don't think you really should need to. Uh, you can work out these probabilities on your calculator, but the most common errors uh, that I see uh, when working out these uh, these probabilities here is that when you plug it into your calculator, the calculator, especially the class whiz, uh, asks you for the standard deviation. I think NumWorks does as well, actually. NumWorks does as well. Um, so it asks you for the standard deviation. But obviously, when you write this down, you're writing down the variance. So quite often, I see people write down uh, sigma divided by n into the standard deviation rather than sigma divided by root n. Okay, so that is what you need to write into your uh, calculator for the standard deviation. So you've got to be a little bit careful with this one um, and make sure that the probability you're getting is reasonable. With PMCC hypothesis testing, we start off with let rho be the population correlation coefficient of and then we describe the two variables that we're working with. H0 is always rho is equal to 0. H1 could be rho is less than 0, rho is greater than 0, rho is not equal to 0, depending on what type of test we're doing. Then we assume H0 is true. Uh, we calculate the PMCC. Uh, of our sample, which is R, we then need to compare that against a critical value. So um, the thing is that um, in the questions that have come previously for AQA, certainly, uh, the PMCC has been given to you and the critical value has been given to you. The critical values are not given in the formula booklet. So it needs to be given to you within the exam paper. OK, so if, for example, the R value that we get given is 0 0.89 and the critical value we get given is 0 0.73, then what that means is that because we know that R goes between minus 1 and 1, then 0 0.73 is about there on our number line. That means that is the critical region. 0.89 is somewhere in here, so that means 0.89 is inside the critical region. So we go 0.89 is greater than 0.73, so the result is significant, so we reject the null hypothesis. And then we write a concluding statement in context that is non committal. Okay? So in this question in the exam, you are likely to be told the PMCC and you have to be told the critical value. So it becomes a situation of um, really an exam question that's going, S tell me whether this number is bigger than this number. So we move into mechanics and you should be able to recognize the units that should be used for each of these uh, quantities. So length we work in meters, time we work in seconds, mass we work in kilos, or kilograms, velocity in meters per second, acceleration in meters per second per second, force is newtons, okay? Now because weight is also a force, weight as we know is mass times the acceleration due to gravity. OK, so that's mass times the acceleration. And so newtons is equivalent to kilogram meters per second per second. And moments are equal to the force times the distance. So newton meters. Now, we also need to know what we mean by each of these. So position, displacement, distance, velocity, speed, and acceleration. Now, it's quite often that people get confused between position and displacement. Position and displacement can be the same if you started at the origin. Okay, So the position is based on how far away from a given origin you are. 
Okay, so as given by a vector. Um, so position and displacement are both vector quantities here. Displacement is how far away from your starting point you were. So you didn't necessarily need to start at the origin. Okay, the distance is the magnitude of the displacement. So the displacement, if it's a 2D vector, then you can work out the distance using Pythagoras' theorem. Okay, and is the, is the length of the vector. So all three of those uh, units wise are given in meters. Then velocity. So velocity is the change in displacement over time. Okay, so velocity itself is a vector um, and is measured in meters per second. Speed is the magnitude of velocity. So if you have the velocity as a 2D vector, you can work out the speed by working out the length of the vector, just like you work out the distance from displacement. The acceleration is the change in velocity over time. So um, the acceleration is measured in meters per second per second. And we don't have like a special term to represent the magnitude of acceleration. So um, you just have to be asked for the magnitude of the acceleration, and then you'd use Pythagoras' theorem again. You need to be able to interpret the graphs of motion, displacement time graphs, velocity time graphs, and acceleration time graphs, and be able to shift between the three. So if you've got a displacement time graph, so let's draw something like that. So this represents displacement, and here's time. OK, so um, let's say um, it goes something like this. Now, let's in try and interpret what that graph is doing. So um, essentially, uh, let's say it's me and I start um, at some point at the origin, say. Then, for a certain amount of time, I walk away. And then, at that point, okay, I start walking back to where I started again. So, I turn, I've turned around, I start walking back to where I started. And I get back to where I started there. Okay? Then, I continue walking in that direction away from where I started and end up somewhere back there. Okay, so if I started here, I walked this way for a certain amount of time, then I changed direction, I got back to where I started, and then I continued on my way. Okay, now you could work out um, the velocity of me um, by working out the gradient of these lines. Okay, so uh, you would be able to work that out straight from the displacement time graph. Okay. Right. How about velocity time graph? Right. Let's change this to velocity. What does this graph mean now? Okay. What's happening? Well, what this means is that I start at zero velocity. So I'm stood still. And then... At a certain point in time, I speed up. Okay, over this bad time, I'm speeding up. So I get faster and faster and faster. And then I reach this point where I reach my maximum velocity. And then I start slowing down again until I get to zero. So I start at rest, I speed up, and then slow down and get to zero. Okay, then what happens here? Well, now I start speeding up, but in the opposite direction. So I've turned around, essentially, and now I start speeding up in the opposite direction. And I'm going back on myself. So the displacement is found by looking at the area under the graph for a velocity time graph. So you can work out how far I've gone doing that. If you want the acceleration, then that is the gradient of these pieces, of these lines. OK, so um, note that 
when you calculate the acceleration for this portion of the line, the acceleration value that you get there, so let's say that's minus 2, if you get minus 2 there, you would also get minus 2 there. But the minus 2 there in each of those two portions is representing something different. So the acceleration here is minus 2 because I am decelerating by 2 metres per second per second. So I am decelerating here. But the minus 2 represents something different here because I'm no longer decelerating. I'm actually accelerating, but in the negative direction. So a negative acceleration could mean that I'm decelerating or accelerating in the negative direction. So be aware of that. Now, for acceleration, OK, if I'm talking about accelerating now, then I start off at a constant speed. OK, so I could be, because the acceleration is zero at that point, so I could be at rest or I could be moving, but at a constant speed. I don't know. But as time increases, I am getting faster and faster and faster until I reach my maximum acceleration. And then um, my acceleration drops off until I uh, get back to a constant speed. OK, and then I start decelerating. OK, um, now, again, because my acceleration is going into the negative direction here, uh, the interpretation is a little bit tricky, OK, because it depends on whether I was um, at rest or whether I was moving at that time. So it gets the interpretation of the diagram gets a little bit fiddly at that point. OK, but uh, if you want to work out the velocity, then um, the velocity is the area under your graph. OK, so you can work out the velocity by the area under an acceleration time graph. Now, the SUVAT equations are given to you in the formula booklet. So this is how they appear in the AQA formula booklet. On the left-hand side, you've got the 1D versions, and on the right-hand side, you've got the 2D versions. OK, so the 1D versions of, uh, for AS and full A-level, uh, the 2D would just be full A-level. Now, you need to be able to derive the 1D SUVAT equations. OK, so... The diagram that is used looks like this. So it is a velocity time graph where it starts from the initial velocity u and has the final velocity v over a certain amount of time t. And the displacement is the area of that trapezium. So the first two that you can find from that is that because you know that the acceleration of a velocity time graph is the gradient of that line, the gradient of that line is the difference in the vertical uh, direction, so v take away u, divided by t. So that can be rearranged to get multiplied by the t, add the u, so it gets you v is u plus at. Then you can get s is equal to 1 half u plus vt by using the area of trapezium. Then you're using these two by thinking about uh, splitting it up. So if you split up into a rectangle plus a triangle, you can get that one. If you do one big rectangle, take away that triangle, you get that one. And then you can algebra mani algebraically manipulate uh, two of them to get that one. Okay. So go back to the video where I do that, because you need to be able to do that in the exam. When you are hit with a SUVAT problem, the wording of constant acceleration is what you're looking for. That tells you that it's a SUVAT question. If the velocity um, has time involved, now I'm going to be a little, little bit careful with what I say here, but if it has time involved, then... Um, it may well be a calculus in kinematics problem, a variable acceleration. Of course, if it's something like v is 2t plus 1, I know that's going to differentiate just to 2. And so it is actually constant acceleration. But you may well still, you may well still use uh, calculus in kinematics techniques. 
So if it's SUVAT, let's say we know it's a SUVAT problem, make sure you set up SUVAT. Okay, write in your information and then use that to solve the problem. So get into a rigorous habit of writing out SUVAT and filling in that information before you continue. So if you've identified that the acceleration is variable, okay, then we're going to use calculus and kinematics to solve the problem. Now, think about SUVAT when you do this. So when we write out SUVAT, we write out this, okay? Now, with constant acceleration, we can use this. With variable acceleration, we're looking at displacement velocity acceleration. Okay? So it's in this order. So let's pop the v, v up a little bit higher. And you differentiate your way down and integrate your way up. D, decrease, differentiate, going down integrate increase okay so if you want the um, displacement and you've got the velocity then you integrate the velocity with respect to time to get the displacement okay and so you integrate the acceleration to get the velocity you differentiate the velocity to get the acceleration you differentiate the displacement to get the velocity Okay. Now, when you are integrating, do not forget your constants of integration. Okay. Now, this could be done in 1D or 2D, okay. in which case, when you are integrating, you've got to make sure that you add in two constants of integration. Let's give an example. So, let's say um, the velocity is equal to... Uh, let's go with um, t squared i plus 3tj, and that's meters per second. Then, the displacement is the integral of that, so that would be one-third t cubed plus some constant c1i plus three-halves t squared plus some constant c2j. So this bit with gravity is specific to a QA, really. At the start of questions, uh, they state use g is 10 meters per second per second, or use g is 9.8 meters per second per second, or use g is 9.81 meters per second per second. If they don't say that, and g as gravity is involved, it's likely that uh, they want the answer just in terms of g, or, in fact, the gravity might actually cancel. Okay? Now, if... The question starts with 10 meters per second per second, then they expect the final answer to be to one significant figure. You must write the final answer to one sig fig. If it's 9.8, then write your answer to two sig fig. If it's 9.81, write your final answer to three sig fig. So don't forget that. Right, projectiles. If there is no diagram, definitely draw one. OK, so let's say we've got a particle projected from the ground. OK, and it's uh, projected with a velocity of, let's say, 10 metres per second and uh, at an angle of 55 degrees. And we want to find um, how far it's travelled, so that horizontal distance, let's say. With all projectile problems, um, set up a set of SUVAT equations. So S U V A T. Don't forget all the SUVAT formulae are given to you in the formula booklet. Okay, so the horizontal acceleration is always zero, the vertical acceleration is always minus g. Okay, so let's say we're using minus 9.8. Then u in the horizontal direction will be 10 cosine 55. And u in the vertical direction will be 10 sine 55. Okay? Now, with that in place, you can then work with um, what you know. You know that the vertical displacement at that point 
is going to be zero, so I could put that at zero. That gives me enough information to work out the time. And then once I've got the time, I'm, I'm going to get two solutions. I'm going to get zero and whatever the time is there. Obviously, I'm not going to use zero. So whatever that time is there, I then use that over here. And now I've got enough information to work out the horizontal displacement. So you're going to use some series of ways of doing that, of using the SUVAT formulae. Uh, if you've got the table there, then you have all the information in one place and you can keep looking at that and um, using it to your advantage. Now we move on to forces and Newton's laws. Now remember a force is just a push or a pull in a particular direction. And so it is a vector because it both has both magnitude and direction. Newton's first law says that a particle will remain at rest or in equilibrium if uh, its forces balance, okay? So if the forces don't balance, then it will be accelerating. So if you have a particle where, let's say, you've got it being pulled to the right by 20 newtons and pulled to the left by 20 newtons and pulled downwards by 10 newtons and pulled upwards by 10 newtons, then this particle is in equilibrium. Now, that means it's either at rest or it's travelling with a constant velocity. But the acceleration of this particle will be zero. The moment I change this, if this now becomes 9 newtons, then it will be travelling downwards with a force of 1 newton. Okay? And so it will be travelling and well, accelerating in that direction, so downwards. Okay? So that is Newton's first law. So Newton's second law is using the equation F equals MA, where F is the resultant force, M is the mass, and A is the acceleration. Okay? Now, let's say we've got a box being pulled along on a smooth surface, so a smooth table, um, by a force of 5 newtons. So it's being pulled to the right, and it's got a mass of 8 kilograms, so the weight would be 8g. Okay, so let's say I wanted to work out the acceleration. So it's accelerating in this direction, so I know it's moving towards the right. So we would have the resultant force, which is 5 newtons, is equal to the mass, which is 8, times by the acceleration. So 5 divided by 8, and that gets me 0 0.625. So the acceleration would be 0 0.625 metres per second per second. OK, let's introduce a frictional force now. So here's a frictional force of 3 newtons. OK, so it's no longer a smooth table. Um, it's now a rough table. There is a 3 newton frictional force. So now F is the resultant force, which is now 5 newtons, take away the 3 newtons. So now we've got 2 divided by 8. And so that's 1 quarter, so 0 0.25 metres per second per second. So as you probably expect, the acceleration has reduced because I've introduced that frictional force. OK. Right, let's change this up slightly again. So now, let's say that this is still a 5 newton force, but it's now working at an angle of, let's say, uh, 35 degrees. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to resolve this into components. So I want to have the horizontal component, which will be 5 cosine 35 and the vertical component 5 sine 35. OK, so now it's still going to be moving horizontally, so it's just moving horizontally. We've got the 5 cosine 35. Now take away the 3. Right, so make sure your calculator is in, um, sorry, in uh, degrees when you do this. Uh, which mine isn't. So 5 times cosine of 35, take away 3, divide by 8, and we get now 
three seven meters per second per second to three sig fig. Okay, so reduce slightly again because now I'm pulling at an angle, but still with the five newton force. So let's say that we're told to use g is equal to 9.8 meters per second per second. And let's say that we have a particle that is attached to a light inextensible string. So there will be tension in the string. Let's say that the mass of the particle is 12 kilos. So its weight will be 12 times g. So 12 g newtons. And let's say that it's accelerating downwards at 2 meters per second per second. And the question asks, find the tension in the string. So to do that, I would resolve vertically, and I would use the notation R, to, and I'm going to take downwards as positive, because that's the direction of motion. Okay. So what I've got is 12G going downwards. Take away the tension, which is going against the direction of motion. So 12G is positive, T is negative, is equal to the mass, 12, times by the acceleration, 2. Okay, so T is going to be equal to 12 lots of 9.8, take away 12 lots of 2, and that gets me 93.6. Now, if you are um, doing AQA, then the fact that we're using G is equal to 9.8 meters per second per second means that we've got to round our answer, our final answer, to two significant figures. We must also include the units, which is newtons, and so for AQA that would be 94 newtons to two significant figures. So Newton's third law is really all about connected particles. Now, my advice with connected particles is to make sure your diagram is good and shows all the forces, okay? So let's say, for example, we have a car and a trailer. Okay, so let's say this is the car and this is the trailer. Okay, now there will be a weight attributed to the car. So, I don't know, um, let's say we've got this as 5,000 G, okay? Uh, there will also be a normal reaction force for the car because it's in contact with the surface. So, let's call that RC for reaction force for the car. The car will have a driving force. Okay, so it's going to be pulling the trailer along by some driving force, so let's call that D. Now, uh, there might be a resistance force, so um, let's call that A for air resistance. So the air resistance on the car, so that could include friction as well, so I'm just going to call that air and air resistance and friction, so the resistance forces. They're connected by an inextensible, well, sorry, by a connecting rod, which is modelled as an inextensible rod um, and is horizontal. And there will be tension in the rod. Now, notice how the way that I'm drawing it is that it's equal and opposite in direction, okay, for the force that's being applied. That's Newton's third law coming into effect here. So I'm drawing it so tension is working in both directions. And it's the same tension. Now the trailer will have a weight. So let's say that's 1000 G. And it, might, it would also have some resistance forces to it. So let's call that a T for the resistance forces for the trailer. And a normal reaction force for the trailer as well. Okay, so it's making sure that the diagram that you draw has all of the forces that are being applied in the problem. Okay, so read the question carefully. Now, when you're doing this, and working with problems with connected particles, if they are both going in the same direction, then you can go about treating it as one particle. I wouldn't suggest that for pulley problems because they're going in, often going in different directions, okay? 
But for something like this, they're both going in one direction, so you can treat it as one particle for certain aspects, right? If you want to treat it as one particle, then that allows you to ignore the tension because they're both working in opposite directions, they cancel each other out. However, then you might go, right, I've got enough information to work out the tension if I focus on the trailer. And then you can use that tension to then work out maybe the resistance force of the car or whatever is required for you to find. So you can then break this part into two separate problems and focus just on one of them. Or you can just treat it as one big particle. Of course, then you're combining the two weights and the resistance forces and also the resistance, uh, sorry, the uh, reaction forces and also the resistance forces. Okay? So take that in mind when you do it. Right. Pulleys also draw a diagram if one's not available. If one has been made available, annotate it. So, pulley system. Something like this. Here's particle A and particle B. Particle A might have a weight of 8G, and particle B will have a weight maybe of 10G. There will be tension in the string. Okay? And where, in which direction would you expect the particles to accelerate? Well, you would expect the heavier particle to move downwards and the lighter particle to move upwards. So B is the heavier particle because its weight is 10G against 8G. So B is going to accelerate downwards and A is going to accelerate upwards. And that allows you to then use Newton's second law to write an equation for particle A. So T, take away 8G, is mass times acceleration. I'm taking upwards as positive here because that's the direction it's going. And then for particle B, it's going downwards. So I'm going to take downwards as positive. 10G take away T is equal to the mass times the acceleration. I get two equations, which I can then solve simultaneously. OK? Now, pulley problems could also be with one of the particles on a table, okay, one of them dropping off the side of the table. So again, tension, tension. Let's say these are the same two particles that I have there. So 8G, weight working downwards, 10G, weight working downwards. Because the A is in contact with the surface, there'll be a normal reaction force. Of course, there's no normal reaction force here because it's not in contact with the surface, right? The surface, if it's smooth, that's all the forces that I've got. If it's rough, there's a frictional force, okay? Likewise, uh, it could be uh, on a slope. So at an angle, here is uh, Particle A, try to make sure it's on the surface. Here's the pulley, here's particle B. So that's 10G, tension, tension, 8G. Okay, so then you can split that up into its components. So that would be, if that's theta, that would be 8G g cosine theta, 8g sine theta, and it's in contact with a surface, so there's a normal reaction force, and if the surface is smooth, there's no uh, resistance, but if it's rough, well, let's put it as F. There we are. Okay, so it's all about labelling your diagram, okay? Label your diagram and then go about solving the problem, setting up the equations. So let's say I've got a particle being acted upon by three forces and I want to find the resultant force, uh, the direction it's going as well. So I'm going to resolve taking to the right as positive. That's a free choice. Okay. But in order to do that, I need to split up this diagonal force into its components. So this is the opposite side. So that'll be 30 sine 50. And this is the adjacent side, so 30 cosine 50. 
So taking to the right as positive, we've got 30 cosine 50 take away 10. Okay, so bung that into your calculator, 30 cosine 50 take away 10, and we get 9.2836 to four decimal places. And then I'm going to take upwards as positive, and I get 30 sine 50 take away 20. So 30 sine 50 take away 20 is 2.9813 to four decimal places. So the resultant force, uh, let's call it F, is 9.2836i plus 2.9813j newtons. So essentially the resultant force is doing something like this. It's going in that direction. Okay, so uh, the particle will be accelerating in that direction. So if I wanted to find its magnitude, so I use Pythagoras to do that. So 9 point, sorry, 2. 836 squared plus 2.9813 squared, square rooted. So square root of 9.2836 squared plus 2.9813 squared, and we get 9.75 to 3 sig fig. So that's newtons to 3 sig fig. And the uh, direction. So uh, the angle that it makes, so if I drew it, that would probably be best. So here's F, and we know it's going 9.2836 in that direction, 2.9813 in that direction. So its angle theta is equal to arctan of 2.9813 divided by 9.2836, which is equal to 2.9813 divided by 9.2836, and that's 17.8 degrees to 3 sig fig. Now you need to know that the friction, F, is less than or equal to mu times R. So mu is the coefficient of friction, and that changes depending on the surface that you are working with, um, how rough the surface is, and R here is the normal reaction force. So if you've got a particle box on a rough surface, it's being pulled along by a rope, let's say, with tension in the rope, it's got the weight working vertically downwards. Then the normal reaction force, because it's in contact with the surface, will be working vertically upwards. And there will be a friction force, F. Now, the roughness of the surface uh, is measured by the coefficient of friction. Now, that might be given in the question, or you might need to find it if you've got enough information to do so. Let's say it's something like 0 0.12, for example. OK. Um, so, essentially, um, it's like you're trying, if, imagine you're trying to pull this uh, box along a surface, okay? You can apply some force, some tension in the rope uh, to pull it along, uh, but maybe that's not enough, it's still not moving, okay? And you're going to reach a point where it is just on the point of moving, in which case F is equal to mu times R, and then it's going to start moving. So if it is on the point of moving, or if it is moving, then we have F is equal to mu times R. If it is not moving, and it's not on the point of moving, then F is less than mu times R. Okay, So you can be asked questions to do with, um, given that information, uh, will the box move? Okay, or it could just form part of a larger problem, and it could be a well uh, a pulley problem on a slope or something like that. 
uh, where it's a, you've got a coefficient of friction as well. So it just becomes an added thing to consider as part of the problem. Now with moments problems, you need to remember that a moment is calculated by multiplying the force by the distance it is away from the point that you're taking moments about. Okay, so force times distance. So that's why a moment is measured in Newton meters. Now, it's likely that in the exam, uh, a diagram will already have been drawn for you. Now, it might be quite a basic diagram, um, but your job is to annotate it and write in all the forces that are being applied. Okay, so let's say we're given this and we're told that we have a rod uh, that is 10 meters long. It's a uniform rod and it weighs 50 newtons. It rests on two smooth supports at A and B. A particle C of 10 newtons is at the particle at uh, point C right on the end, two meters away from B. Okay, find the reaction force at A and the reaction force at B. Okay, so the moment I get a problem like this, I want to make sure I annotate where the weight of the rod is. So I know that it's uniform, so that means it's going to act right in the centre of the rod. So there, and it was 50 newtons, and this is going to be 5 metres. And because that's 2 metres, that's going to have to be 3 metres, like so. Now there's a reaction force at A. Let's label that as RA and a reaction force at B because the rod is in contact with a surface there and a surface there. Now, don't make the mistake of adding in a reaction force for the particle at C. Okay? Although C is in contact with the surface, the reaction force is acting on C. It's not acting on the rod. So we only label forces acting on the rod. Now, if I want to work out the normal reaction at A and the normal reaction at B, uh, a couple of things to note. Firstly, don't forget that you can take and resolve forces vertically. Okay, So don't forget that you can resolve forces vertically and say, right, because if the rod is in equilibrium, I know that the forces going upwards, which are those two forces there, take away the forces going downwards has got to be equal to zero okay because it's in equilibrium so i know that r a plus r b has got to be equal to 60. so don't forget that you can do that and that can save you time right now i can choose to take moments about any point i like here it's really a free choice now when you do it Make sure you um, identify it clearly to the examiner. So I'm going to take moments about point A, okay? And that's my free choice, and the total moment will be equal to zero. So I am five meters away from the 50 Newton force. Now that is going in that direction round, so clockwise. And so because it's clockwise, it is negative, okay? So. 5 times minus 50. Then I am 8 metres away from RB, which is going in an anti-clockwise motion, and that's positive. So plus 8 times RB. And then I am 10 metres away from the 10 Newton force, and that's going in a clockwise motion, so take away 10 times 10, and that's got to be equal to 0. Right, so I've got 10 times 10 uh, plus 50 times 5, divide by 8, and I get that RB must be equal to 43.75 newtons. And because I've already worked that out, I can say RA is 60, take away that, so 16.25 newtons. So you can see that actually I didn't need to then take moments again to work out RA. I can use that fact there. So don't forget that. OK, so that's how we can work through a moments problem. Make sure you label the diagram. Now, if it's on the point of tilting, I could change this problem slightly so that, let's say, I don't know what the weight of particle C is 
but it's now on the point of tilting, okay? So, how does that change things? Well, if it's on the point of tilting, then the rod wants to do this, okay? So, there will be a reaction force at B, but there won't be a reaction force at A anymore because the rod will have tilted and it will no longer be in contact with that point there. So, the normal reaction force at A is now gone. So now, if it's on the point of tilting, I now have this information, and I can take moments about point B, and I am three metres away from the 50 Newton force, which is going in an anti-clockwise motion, so that's positive, and two metres away from the W force, so, and that's going in a clockwise motion, so negative, so take away 2W, is equal to zero. So 3 times 50 is 150, divided by 2 is 75. So if the particle weighs 75 newtons, I know that it will be on the point of tilting, about point B. Now, the only other thing you should keep an eye out for is non-uniform rods, which means that um, the weight of the rod no longer necessarily acts through the centre, or it won't act through the centre, in which case that gives you another thing to play around with and work out. So, in this case, if it was a non-uniform rod, I wouldn't necessarily know where that 50 Newton force is being applied. So I might label that as X, as an unknown. OK? And then I would have to work through from there. I'd probably have to have a little bit more information, right, um, from that point uh, to solve that problem there. But that is how you're going to deal with it. And work through the videos that I've done on moments, and you can see um, how those different problems can, those different bits can be applied. Now, if you're at Excel, then you've also got to deal with ladder problems. Um, in AQA, uh, we don't, but um, at Excel, you do, and OCRA, you do, but not MEI. Um, so, with ladder problems, again, it's all about labeling the diagram, okay? So, make sure it is fully labeled. And then you're um, taking moments along your ladder. And don't forget that you can resolve horizontally and vertically as well um, with your forces. OK, so I've got plenty of videos going through those examples as well. So make sure you take a look at those um, and go through as many exam questions as you can.